All right, so we're going to call this meeting to order at 735. I am joined by my colleagues, Mr. O'Leary, Mrs. Gonzalez, Mr. Walner, and Mr. Studo. And as Mr. Gilberto just announced, this meeting is being recorded by the town as well as we believe it is being recorded by NORCAM. And we will begin with the recitation of the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, so we are going to start with a quick explanation of this new platform that we're all adjusting to. Mr. Gilberto. Thank you, Madam oh, Chair. Man, one second. Phil's, Phil's telling us to hang on a second. There. Sorry, I just want to make sure that uh, we're, oh, you're recording. I want to make sure, yeah, I'm able to record this too. Sorry, I just heard you guys get back in. All right. And we uh, did enough that you are, we did see you in there. We did enough that you'd be recording as well. Okay. All right, thank uh, you. Thank you. All right. All right. Yeah, Let's you go. Are you recording? Okay. Uh, yes. Yep. You are great. Okay. I'm uh, Madam Chair. Through you, I'm going to mute everybody just uh, for a moment. If that's okay. Yes. And then, Madam Chair, I've unmuted you as well. Um, so thank you um, through you, Madam Chair, to the members of the board, to uh, those who are participating in this meeting through this virtual platform and to um, the general public that may be watching uh, via NORCAM as well. Um, so this evening we are testing a different meeting platform. Um, it's called GoToMeeting, and it's something that we have been uh, referred to in recent months as uh, a potentially less costly um, to facilitate virtual meetings that actually offers us additional uh, benefits from what Zoom uh, offers. So well, no, no final determination has been made to make a switch. Uh, this is, uh, in fact, a, an experimental meeting to see how it works for, um, for uh, this meeting. Um, for those who are participating through the virtual platform, if you scroll down to the bottom of your screen, you'll see very similar icons to Zoom for your microphone to mute yourself, for your camera to turn it on or off, for the ability to share your screen, and of course, to, to leave the meeting as well. Um, there are similar functions on the upper right-hand side, both for a listing of participants to show you who's in the meeting. Um, that's a couple of, uh, so looks like two people standing one behind the other. Then there's the, uh, what looks like a little quotation um, next to that, that is for identifying uh, chat, and then you have some settings that you may um, select as well. Um, this technology does have the ability to participate both by telephone and by um, uh, computer as well. I see a number of folks are on via their computer. So the thinking is we'll try to see how this goes um, with uh, the meeting this evening. Um, the, 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 the uh, technology actually includes the ability to generate a transcript of the meeting as well, which uh, may be helpful uh, for the generation of the meeting minutes as well in terms of providing additional information. Um, so that's something we're going to look at the end product on as well. Um, we've done some experiments, but we were actually just able to get the transcript function up and running at roughly 625 this evening. So uh, we haven't had the chance to review how the, what the quality looks like from a test, but we'll do so after this evening's meeting. So I'll stop it at that, Madam Chair. And I think that you know the meeting will probably be very similar to previous meetings. And um, if there's any issues, I do have the information technology director on the meeting with us as well to be helpful. Um, we'll ask him to hang around just for a little bit to make sure there's no bugs. Thank you, Matt. All right. Okay, thank you, Mr. Gilberto. And our next order of business are the minutes for the November 16, 2020 regular and executive session minutes. Mr. Vincenzo, you are muted. Madam Chair, I move to approve the November 16, 2020 regular session minutes as written. Mr. O'Leary, I can see that you seconded, but you're muted too. Second. Right. Mr. Studo, <laughs> by Mr. Studo, second by Mr. O'Leary. Any discussion? Seeing none. Mr. O'Leary. Aye. Mrs. Gonzalez, you're muted. Aye. 
Mr. Walner. Aye. Mr. Scudro. Aye. Manny Pelli is aye. Uh, Madam Chair, I move to approve the November 16, 2020 executive session minutes as written. Second. <clears throat> Motion by Mr. Studo, second by Mr. O'Leary. Any further discussion? Seeing none. Mr. O'Leary. Aye. <clears throat> Gonzalez. Aye. Mr. Walner. Aye. Mr. Studo. Aye. And Upelli is aye. Next order of business is a COVID-19 update. Mr. Gilberto. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just a very brief update. Um, I think a, a much more extensive update for the community presented at the Board of Health meetings that are going to take place later this week. The, I think the sort of short update, update. is... I'm going to get some feedback. Yeah. Bear with me one moment. Okay, seems like the feedback has stopped. Yes. Um, so at, we expect a more extensive update at the Board of Health meeting, but you know we have continued to see um, incremental increases in case numbers here in North Reading um, over the past month or so. And the trend that we've talked about and has continued in recent weeks. And similar activity has been occurring in public schools as well. And we're working closely through the public health nurse with the school nurses to address each instance of an identified case in the schools, be it student or faculty, and appropriate notifications are taking place. We have seen um, some positive changes amongst the workforce, and we have been responding to, to and following up um, in contact tracing on each case um, as each case has come up. Um, municipal services remain open, although our buildings are closed to um, walk-in traffic um, by the public. Uh, we have identified a couple of locations here in the town hall where when necessary we can meet with the public by appointment only and um, we continue to encourage residents to visit the town website to contact departments by telephone number or to do um, email access um, as well send an email to the department um, to conduct business. Um, and so I think that that's sort of the, the, the short status update. Uh, you know, it, it, I would say it's you know, similar to where we were at in the last meeting, although the case numbers do continue to increase much as we are seeing in um, statewide and in fact across the, uh, the country. Um, there is a working group of department heads, including those from the public schools, and, and we reviewed this with the financial planning team as well, that is working through the spending requirements for federal funding. Um, I think most folks are aware we have a pretty substantial deadline upcoming of December 30th for federal funding, um, and we're working you know, to ensure that we are um, addressing all of our needs to the greatest extent possible with the understanding that we're gonna need to have available funding potentially for the period after December 30th to address costs. And so we've tried to work strategically with departments um, um, in, in consulting with the finance director in, in order to sort of move funding into the appropriate buckets. And I think um, we have the, uh, an appropriate plan in place to make the best use of those resources. And my hope is that we have a detailed report of, a, of where we <clears throat> closer toward that deadline on the, the December 21st meeting. Um, but just to show there is quite a bit of effort underway to make sure we maximize that funding and its use um, as we approach the deadlines. Okay, thank you, Mr. Calperno. Do the members have any questions? Mr. O'Leary? Um, questions, comments, just to, in relation, you know, where we are today, you know, not just as a town, but as a nation and as a state, I mean, 173,500 new cases today uh, nationwide. On average, 196,800 per day for the last two weeks. That's since our last meeting. That's up 15%. We're at almost 15 million people have been infected uh, with this, which was at 11 million just two weeks ago. We had 283,000 deaths. And again, I'm just reiterating these numbers to, to drive home to anybody who's listening here that you know this is real. This is happening. This is upon us. You know, in Massachusetts, we've got uh, over 250,000 cases and uh, 10,800 deaths, you know, to date, as of today. 58,500 active cases in Massachusetts that are being monitored. Now, hospitalization is over 1,500 hospitalizations as of today. Um, 
again, the seven day average is at 5.5%. If you take out the, the testing that they do on, on the college kids, we're actually at 7.4%. You know, our, our mean before was it 0 0.8? I mean, this thing is really upon us and Thanksgiving hasn't even hit yet. Um, you know, so it, it's real. And here, here in North Reading, again, I spoke with the health uh, director today. I mean, they're monitoring between 70 and 80 cases just here in our community right now. It was as high as 95 a couple of weeks ago. You know, so it's here, you know, and we have to be careful. And we have to be cognizant and we have to all do our part. You know, it, for those of us among us who are in denial, please stop. Think about others. Don't think about yourself. Don't be concerned about uh, civil liberties and all the rest. This is to protect ourselves. And, and fortunately, you know, vaccines are on the way. That's a good thing. But it's months and months away before it, you and I are going to be able to, to get vaccinated because, you know, the, the healthcare workers are going to be first, the seniors are going to be uh, second, in the nursing homes and assisted living facilities, as it should be, because they're the most vulnerable. So it's months away. So we still have a lot of work to do ourselves in order to make the uh, small sacrifices. And again, I don't know. I hope everybody's Thanksgiving holiday was 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 good. Uh, mine was wonderful, but very different and much smaller. You know, my my gathering, my family gathering was minuscule compared to what it used to be. But it's a small sacrifice to make to make sure that next year we can all get together. So I just implore everybody to, you know, get over the, you know, this isn't real and it's a, and it's a farce because it's not. And so we all need to make these small sacrifices for the next several months uh, until everybody can uh, get the vaccinations and, and things start uh, getting back to normal. So part of my report on the Board of Health is, you know, they're doing a good job of monitoring and, and collaborating with all our town departments and with regional uh, on a regional basis with other health departments to find out what's going on in other communities and it's critical you know that we have this level of communication and uh, i've been assured from the health agent that you know they don't anticipate any local changes you know to regulations here locally in north reading you know unless it's in concert with regional and, and statewide uh, collaborations so we can, we can be sure that you know the local board of health isn't just going to go off on their own and say you know ten people in CVS or whatever it's going to be, you know unless it's in collaboration with the with the state in some um, coordinated effort on a regional basis. But it's really important um, that we do take this seriously, uh, take the responsibility. If you're not going to take it for yourself, take it for others. Uh, you know, wear your mask, follow the protocols, do as you're asked. In, in the next several months, hopefully there's some light at the end of the tunnel. But again, I applaud uh, everybody's efforts here locally mm. and nationally uh, for what they're trying to do to, to get it done. And it's just some knuckleheads that are that are hurting everybody. So hopefully the message gets through. Hopefully people hear it. And uh, and again, as I said, weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks pass. You know, we have to speak locally, act locally, and hopefully it. it filters on up. If it's not coming from the top, let's get it from the bottom up. So let's do our part here in North Reading, and I think we're doing a pretty good job here um, to help coordinate and, again, spread the message uh, statewide and nationally. Thank you, Madam Chair. Okay. Thanks, Mr. O'Leary. Mrs. Gonzalez, do you have any questions for Mr. Gilberto? I do not. Mr. Walner, do you have any questions for Mr. Gilberto or no comments? Problem. Nope. Mr. Studo? No, all right. I, I'm going to just reiterate, not as long as Mr. O'Leary did because he covered all the bases, but just to thank the town, the town administrator, the school, the school uh, administrator, the superintendent, for keeping us in the loop, regularly updating us about what is going on and not throwing alarm on it, but just, you know, giving us the most updated information as to what's what's transpiring and where, because we appreciate that information. All right, um, next order of business is public comment. And again, if anybody would like to, there's a function at the top that's a chat function. It's a little bit different than the Zoom meeting. But if anyone that's attending would like to uh, comment, I don't see any chat, Mr. Gilberto, do you? 
I do not either. Okay. All right. So I think we can move on to, they don't have a raised hand on this. Uh, no, my, my screen does not show a raised hand on the bottom. No. Yeah. Yeah. A little different. All right. So we'll move on to the next, which is board member reports. We'll kick it off with you, Mr. O'Leary. I know you kind of gave a little bit of a report from Board of Health, but uh, I did get a little. Else? I did get a little report from the Board of Health, and, and again, they have it another yeah. meeting Wednesday evening. Um, so I'm sure the town administrator and uh, and I will give you an update at the next at the next meeting. <clears throat> and again, just as far as water, um, water, wastewater, sewer, uh, we're going to have a comprehensive uh, update this evening for the board and for the community in relation to what's going on as far as the water projects that are forthcoming. Um, in the course of our water rate hearing, a lot of that will be covered also. Um, and then as far as wastewater, again, an update will be given by our consultants this evening. And I just want to acknowledge um, people who will be presenting to the board tonight, people from Wright Pierce. Uh, Rob Williamson, uh, Mike Stein, and, and Colin Stewart have been working very hard uh, for months and months, well now years on some of them, uh, for water and wastewater. So the update will be uh, enlightening for a lot of people here. But again, I'd also like to acknowledge, you know, Mark Clark, our water superintendent, who's been putting a significant amount of time and effort. Uh, John Clipfell, our town engineer. Chris Deming, our acting uh, EPW director, the town administrator, of course, uh, working hard, and Mr. Sudo for working very diligently and hard to come up to speed on everything that's uh, that we're talking about. So he's been putting in a lot of effort into uh, to, to coming up to speed. So the board is going to be uh, well informed after this evening, and I won't have to give any more reports. Thank you. Madam Thank Chair? You. Yes. I apologize for interrupting the board member reports, but something very important for those who may be participating by telephone. If you do wish to um, to speak, and you're on mute, if you press star six, you can unmute yourself. And if you press it again, you can also mute yourself. So somebody is looking to be recognized and they're on the telephone, press star six and say, Madam Chair. Do you mean for the public hearing coming up or for public comment? Do you uh, want for to- a public comment or at any point when the public is okay. being recognized, yes. Okay, so why don't we go back <laughs> to the- Hold the thought on the board member reports. Why don't we go back and just double check to see if any of the attendees want to speak at public comment. If you could press star six, you said on the phone? Correct. Um, we're, we have not proceeded to the public hearing yet. That That's coming up next. So if you're here to speak on the public hearing, we haven't started that public hearing, but if you're here to speak for public comment, Please feel free. No? I'm not seeing or hearing any. Okay. All right, so we, we've moved on from, from the public comment portion, the general public comment. We just heard Mr. O'Leary's report. And um, let's go to Mr. Walner. Do you have any reports, Mr. Walner? Yes. I'm hearing feedback. Excuse me, Mr. Mr. Walner. Is there a way for you to mute Mr. Mr. Gilbert? Because I can hear a lot of feedback, and I don't know what that's coming from. Madam Chair, I, I, so I did just talk with the IT director, and it, it may be a function of feedback from a volume on on uh, um, on an audio speaker. So if folks could just, you know, if anyone's got their volume up kind of high, if they could lower it just a little bit, and then I will also mute. Okay, it's gone now. So, all right, Mr. Walner. Yeah. Um, two any things. reports? Yes. Um, two things. One is I've been reporting every every session about what's going on with the Age Friendly Initiative. This is the effort to um, better assess what's going on with a growing demographic in our town by working with our consultants, UMass Gerontology. Um, they've completed the survey results of 1,300 residents that responded. They have completed the focus groups. We did four different focus groups, um, stakeholders, uh, key informants, rising seniors, seniors, and we did a fifth of everybody who couldn't make the other four. So we've completed that. We are now moving on to um, doing peer comparisons to other communities in the state. 
uh, on two fronts. One front is to look at our, our efforts to create an intergenerational community center, which would be comprised of uh, parks and rec, <coughs> senior center, uh, youth services, and veteran services compared to other communities have, have already gone down the pike to get a comparison about what we might be expecting if we go down that, down that way and how we can be better prepared to do that. And then the second uh, thrust is to, uh, to become an age-friendly uh, community. You really need someone very similar to like a Jen Ford who does this for youth services. You need someone who's focused on uh, driving an age-friendly initiative. Consider an age-friendly director if you want. Um, that would drive our town towards an age-friendly thing. So we're also looking at peer communities where they've created those kind of positions and so we can get a feel for what that might look like in our own town. So making very fast progress. We're hoping to have finalized reports by around May, June is the plan and look forward to sharing that all. And I look forward to seeing the report myself because I haven't been able to be involved with seeing the data, um, just part of the way it goes. Uh, Catherine McKay, uh, Jen Ford, and myself um, have been actively involved in leading this. Um, Kim Manzelli had to step away for uh, personal family reasons. We miss her, but we're at a good point to do this on our own. So we're feeling good about that. Um, the second thing is, you know, the town uh, uh, allowed the CPC to come up with money to work with Abacus, which is a consultant, to look at the Old Stop and Shop area where Ocean Lot is now, the we call it the Winter Street Main Street project. Um, CPC had a meeting last week. I attended that with Abacus. They have come up with concept drawings about what what that may look like. It's concept drawings based on us being able to do a package treatment plant there now, and and potentially hook up with the sewage later on. You know, eight, nine, ten years later. Um, but it's allowing us to do drawings. It's a mixed use. Uh, concept of uh, you know uh, townhouse townhouses apartments things of that nature plus retail and open space plus potentially the intergenerational community center being in the middle of it so we have the drawings and we're right now doing a reality check with some developers to find out if we're on the right path um, before we start to um, take it to the next level so that's making good progress uh, those are the two things that I have on my plate thank you. Thank you. Mr. Studo, board member reports? Yes, um, I will piggyback on some info on the CPC that there is a interim appointment that the CPC is discussing uh, to have a uh, formal vote on on December 15th. Um, and then at that point, there will be a notice sent out on the transcript due to a resignation uh, of one of the members. So that's kind of just an FYI. And there was a memo as well that I could read if you want, but it just pretty much summarized the same thing. And uh, on the bigger update is I'd like to make a brief statement uh, just to kind of give a summary of, of what's going on with the 20 Elm Street uh, 40B application of um, Mr. Yaba and uh, New York Ventures for their project. Um, and again, this is more just to give, it is, it's a summary of everything that's gone on and there's been, a, it's one of those situations where there's been a lot that's happened and a lot that, and then really nothing has happened. Um, so I'll, I'll just give that brief <clears throat> summary because I know that we've had a lot of questions from uh, a lot of people, you know, many members of the community. So the the 1.5 percent appeal is still before the Housing Appeals Committee. Ordinarily, the parties would have filed their testimony, and a hearing would have taken place by now on the issue of whether the town meets the 1.5 land area minimum. However, during the past year, the applicant was filed a number of motions aimed at getting confidential information on group home locations into evidence. These efforts, which include subpoenas to state agencies for documents and discovery requests to the board, have delayed the proceedings. The parties are currently in another round of briefing on the issue of whether evidence on the location of group homes can be introduced. By law, this information cannot be disclosed without a court order. In addition, group home acreage provided by DG DHCD supposed to be relied upon by all parties and the HAC. The board has made 
both of these arguments in response to the applicant's many motions. The presiding officer will rule on these round of motions sometime after December 8th. After that ruling, the parties will file their testimony in a hearing scheduled. At this point, it is hard to predict when that hearing might be, as it depends on when the presiding officer rules on the motions. So uh, that's just kind of the matter of facts of what's going on, and it just it's going to be a little bit longer before we have clarity on the next step. And uh, Madam Chair, that's what I have. Okay, thank you, Mr. Studo. Mrs. Gonzalez? Um, I have nothing to report right now, um, just a comment that um, I am liaison to the Veterans Committee and I would like to acknowledge that it is Pearl Harbor Day and um, just make an acknowledgement of that. That's all. Thank you. I just want to um, say a huge thank you to Representative Jones and Mrs. Jones and Senator Tarr, the team at the Senior Center, Mary and Sherry, um, for the magnificent job that was done to my fellow colleagues who showed up to help pick up and pick up and pass out. Uh, Mrs. Gonzalez and Mr. O'Leary, Mr. Studer and I were all there to help whatever way we could. And um, I just want to say thank you for that effort. That was amazing, not only for the people that organized it and set it up, uh, over 200 over 200 bags were Thanksgiving bags were provided, and then a whole car, a whole truck of donations from the seniors that came by donating their um, donating food to the food pantry. So um, they gave something, they got something that that was just something totally different. The seniors look forward to this every year, and so do we. We we always get invited, and we all you know we it's a it's a great day so it was wonderful to be able to redo this um, in this way in co during COVID-19. And I also want to um, make mention while we're on board member reports that we do have a number of boards and commissions and committees that are have vacancies and we're in the process of filling, ex filling expired terms or reappointments. So if you are interested for there's certain um, citizen activity forms that we keep on record for a while, but if you're either new to the town or new to volunteering, like we all do, uh, please fill out a citizen activity form and list any board commission or committee that you're interested in serving on. There are many uh, open, uh, there are many open positions on different commi commissions and committees. So please put your citizen activity form in. It's a labor of love. We're all volunteers, but we're all mission oriented to making our town a better place, as you can see in here from all of the things that you just heard from board member reports. So that's kind of a, a press release to any attendees that aren't already serving, because I can see most of you are. Um, but Mr. Walner. Yeah, I just- um, I'm gonna go back to you. Sorry, just because you brought it up. Um, I actually, I got a few phone calls from people asking why I wasn't at the senior uh, uh, event and why I wasn't doing it. I just never got an invite. So I think it was just an oversight. I was surprised as anybody when I saw you all in the paper. So I apologize for not being there. Um, I just wasn't, that just didn't get an invite. I'm sure it was just an oversight, but it wasn't uh, intentional. <laughs> Well, no, I don't think any any soul is going to question your commitment to seeing the Arizona of the town, Mr. Walter. So if we could all be at everything, that would be wonderful. But we haven't been able to figure out how to buy locate yet. So, you know, it's okay. Don't, don't worry about it. But just a shout out to, to Representative Jones, Mrs. Jones, and everybody that was there to make that happen, all the seniors and people that brought seniors there to pick up their bag. It was it was amazing. It was a great, great, uh, great afternoon. Yeah. All right, now Mr. <laughs> O'Leary. Yeah, it, just as a follow up, again, part of the part of the day, and again, congratulations to uh, Linda and Brad Jones and Senator Taft for being able to, first of all, being very so creative. It, yeah. It, again, continuing the tradition and, and trying to uh, meet some needs and 
uh, gather the community together. They did a fantastic job. But again, I also had the the the, the privilege and the, uh, and the pleasure of dropping some stuff off. You know, for people who weren't able to get out, they had a list of people who were who were shut ins who weren't weren't able to. I know um, Mr. Studo did too. Um, just go knock at the door and deliver the package too. And people were extremely grateful uh, for uh, being included, not being forgotten. And uh, these were people who would normally have attended the, uh, the sit down dinner. But uh, that too just added an additional uh, exclamation point to the to the benefit and the uh, the value of what was what was done. So uh, congratulations again to, to Brad and Linda Jones and Senator Tarr. Uh, they did a terrific job and again very creative in, in their approach and and it was smooth too pretty good nobody got run over people were extremely yeah. generous as you put it extremely generous to the food pantry and bringing some yeah. some goods and things so it, it was just an all-around great day so mm -hmm. again thank you uh, for the opportunity all right okay so i think that concludes the board member reports and we're going to move on and thank you for your patience <laughs> we're moving on to the 7 30 public hearing on paradise r2 inc doing business as new england beverage i'm just going to read the um notice of public hearing and oh i'm sorry mr Kilberto. sorry to interrupt but i i did see that there's a question in the chat relative to um, the focus groups, I think, that Mr. Walner was speaking to earlier. A question from Ms. Earl, but was how many focus groups took place? Yep. Uh, so, again, I, I'll look at the chat just real quick. Yeah. Um, oh, Abigail. So, Abigail was on one of those. So, thanks for asking that question. Uh, there was five in total and about 10 to 15 people per, per focus group. And again, the classification was key informants. There was like six or seven key informants in town. And then there was a rising seniors, which represents the people recently without kids in the schools who are in their 50s, was another group. Another group was seniors, people who are, you know, clearly seniors in town. Uh, another group was stakeholders, various uh, town employees who have a key interest in this. And the last group was whoever couldn't make any of those four ended up in the fifth group. So we had five groups in all. And uh, just briefly, I heard very consistent enthusiasm for the participants for a number of things we're trying to work on as a board and as a community. And so five, five, five groups of 15 participants. About 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10 to 15? Yeah. Okay, 15, 15 to 75 people. Really accurate. Um, I'm sorry, but I was in a focus group, and while they sent out invitations to probably 12 to 15 people, it was very clear in the invitation, it was all but underlined, that this was um, option. You know, if you wanted to come, that was great. And the group that I was in, um, there were only five people that responded and attended. So yeah, I don't. You were in group number five. You were in the last residual group that was people who couldn't make other ones were in the last group. Okay, so but you just need to be careful that it's not five times 15. Just saying. Thank you. Okay. All right. So we're going to move on to the next order of business, which is the public hearing on Paradise R2. <clears throat> This is the notice of public hearing in accordance with chapter 138 of the Massachusetts General Laws, which is a virtual public hearing held by the Select Board Monday, December 7th, 2020 at 7.30 p.m. on the application of Paradise R2 Incorporated doing business as New England Beverage for the transfer of the package store, all alcohol license from Sunny Raya Inc. doing business as New England Beverage and redemption license to be exercised at 160 Main Street, North Reading, Massachusetts, in a two-story building occupying 9,980 square feet, selling space on the first floor, offices and storage on the second. This hearing is a continuation of hearings held on October 19th and November 2nd, 2020, with the, by the Select Board. So... Pardon. Good evening, Madam Chair, members of the Select Board. My name is James Rudser. I have previously been before this board with respect to not only this application, but then the uh, 
the discipline matters that were heard last month. Um, having had a chance to review the original October 9th hearing and then the application that my client submitted, I would uh, suggest that no additional updates are necessary. And um, uh, Kevin Lang and his wife, Susan, had been in, the, have had two prior liquor stores. Um, and uh, at the time he entered the contract for this agreement, he was exploring the possibility of acquiring an interest in, a, in another store. Um, I can tell you what that was. That involved Broadway Social Wine, Inc., um, a, 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 a liquor store, a licensed package store on, on, on West Broadway in South Boston. Um, I know a little bit about it because I represent the, uh, uh, having represented Kevin in the past, and I, I actually represent uh, this family that owns that store. And as a result of that, um, you know, they both obtained separate counsel um, with respect to the written contract. Um, I do know that this application is is complete. That that transaction uh, did never did not occur. Um, just to put it into context, that that Kevin said that he had an interest. Well, Kevin was working at the store and essentially conducting his due diligence in the store for a lengthy period of time during this uh, this uh, the uh, beginning part of 2020. Um, much like he was working in the store at this location at 160 Main Street when, in fact, the license premises inspection was was undertaken. Um, that all being said, um, you know, my client is a responsible, experienced operator of, of, of licensed establishments under General Laws Chapter 138. I had previously proposed at the last meeting that, that this board could anticipate him contracting with a company called ID Science to provide for uh, license scanning. Um, and um, in fact, he has entered into that agreement with them and then the system will be installed in the store in the event that the, the proposed transfer is approved by this board, as well as the proposed pledge. Um, I would point out that uh, an important part of this is the pledge of the license because it's essentially seller financing. Um, my client is, you know, paying a substantial amount of cash, but uh, there is a pledge of uh, the, the 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 assets that would be proposed to be transferred, and that pledge is not to a bank or anything, but rather to the current operator of the license. Um, if the board has any questions, I'm happy to try to answer them. I saw my client here earlier. I can't see him here now. So I apologize if he got disconnected, but I definitely saw him at one point. He's still oh, there. He is. There he is. Oh, there he is. Okay. Yeah, I'm the now. Okay. Welcome. Thank you. Okay. Do, do members have any questions? Well, let's kick it off with you, Mr. O'Leary. Uh, no, other, other than uh, just maybe a little further explanation as to the misunderstanding as far as his interest. I mean, uh, obviously, I would think that if some cash were, or there was an outlay of cash uh, for an interest in, in another business that would have taken place, uh, I guess I just don't understand the the misstatement at the time, or maybe there was some cash put out and was returned. Just a further explanation as to okay. just clarifying there, it, what the situation it, it, was. Okay, that that and and it's my understanding that there was a, a contract that was entered into for him to acquire an interest in another store. That was an executory contract. He never closed on it. Um, and the reason he didn't close on it is because the purchase price under that to get half a store was the purchase price to buy this entire store. So when the opportunity to acquire this entire store came up, um, Kevin Lang uh, withdrew from that contract and then signed the contract with Sun and Raya to uh, obtain this thing. Um, during that period of time, while it was under contract, he was conducting his due diligence in the South Boston store. He was in the store, and I think that may have been the result of the misunderstanding that he had some interest when he blurted that out. Um, my client was nervous. He's never appeared before a licensing board before. Um, I have previously done licensing work for him. I quite frankly don't understand why I wasn't involved, but I am now. So my apologies to the board 
and I hope I've addressed uh, Mr. O'Leary's question. Well, I, I hope I'm not as frightening this time as I may have been last time. So. <laughs> Thank you for the explanation. Okay. All set, Mr. O'Leary? Yes, thank you. Okay. Um, Mr. Walner, any questions about the packet or the, to the licensee? Or uh, no, I, no, I do not have any questions. Thank you. Okay. Mr. Studo? No, no questions. Thank you. Mrs. Gonzalez? I'm all set. Yes, um, Mr. Gilberto. Whenever my turn comes up, Madam Chair, I don't know if you have any questions. No, that's okay. You you can you go next. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Lee, Madam Chair. Uh, perhaps to Attorney uh, Rudzer. Good evening, sir. Um, so, going through the the application, you know, we. we did a quick search of the Secretary of State's records, and I'm trying to reconcile the establishments with which Mr. Lang's name shows up with the list that's been provided here. Okay. So East Broadway Incorporated, I see clearly identified as uh, on the Secretary of State's website. Lynn Lickermart, I also see clearly identified as well um, on there. Um, Dairy Mart. Could you just tell us what, where is that located? Uh, Dairy Mart was a store. I'm sorry. Dairy Mart was a store on uh, on Route 60 in Revere. Okay. And that's a, that's actually the transaction where I first met Mr. Lang because my clients, uh, the same actually principals of, of of Broadway Social Wines, were the owner of that store and they sold it to uh, to Mr. Lang. Okay. And Crest Avenue Wine and Spirits, I'm, I'm I'm not able to reconcile that one with with the Secretary of State's recordings. That, that was a liquor store in uh, in Winthrop that Mr. Uh, Lang had it, had uh, purchased and then has subsequently sold. Okay, and so just quickly um, going from the Secretary of State's site. 26-28 New Ocean CNL Incorporated. Okay. Address that, road. that those, Mr. Lang has also been involved in real estate investments. And so there's a number of entities that were real estate um, holding companies that he had previously had or had an interest in. Um, I can tell you, for example, um, the Furnace Brook, uh, 112 Furnace Street was uh, was a property, I believe it was in Marshfield or something, that Mr. Lang had had purchased uh, a bank-owned piece of property. So while he has had investments in uh, liquor stores, he has also had investments in in, in real estate. But um, and and so that's why there may or appear, may or may not appear to be a crossover. So, okay. And then um, for this uh, additional company, Riley NK Incorporated. Uh, I don't know anything about Riley. I can see that it was created in 2014 and dissolved in 2017. I, I'm not aware of it having any interest in, uh, in any licensed establishment. Okay. Uh, may, may I speak? Um... Yes, of uh, course, yeah. Mr. Riley, Lang. Riley, Riley NK Incorporated, DBA as a Crest app, Wine and Spirit, which is was sold. So that that's a that was an alcoholic licensed establishment. Oh, that was the disclosed one. Yeah. I'm sorry, that was Crest app, Wine and Spirits. Yeah. He owned. Uh, he he created. Uh, according to his answer, he created uh, uh, Riley NK in 2014 to take. Uh, uh, do to purchase the Crest Ave Wine and Spirits, which is disclosed on 6B on his application. I think part of the problem is is that he put the license name and not the corporate name on uh, on 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 the application for transfer. So, Attorney Redser, so for the the first 
the last one we discussed, 26 to 28 New Ocean CNL, it's listed as incorporated to operate a liquor store in the Commonwealth? Uh, that was Lynn Liquor Mart. Okay. And, and that was disclosed under Section 60C of his application. Okay, and so the last one, um, Mega Liquor Incorporated? That was, uh, I believe, a store that uh, his brother owns in in um, Saugus. Let me just take a peek. That was in Lynn, Attorney Vesley. Oh, I'm sorry. That's the one with your that your brother, correct? Yes. Yes, sir. Okay. So, is Mr. Link does not have an interest in that, or did not have an interest in it? He no longer has an interest in it. No. Okay. Thank you, Madam Chair. Well, big, but those would be uh, that's that's Lynn Liquor Mart, or is that the one you're talking about? Our, no, I don't. I don't Lynn think I'll is disclosed. Madam Chair, Lynn Liquor Mart is disclosed okay. on uh, Section 6C, and that's the uh, that's the one store that he had the license prob. He had a three-day suspension back in 2011. So there's Mega Liquor Store. It's Lynn Liquor Mart Incorporated and Mega Liquor Incorporated. Uh, Mega Liquor was a store that his uh, his brother had, and it was uh, organized in 2014 and dissolved, or pardon me, 2004 and dissolved in 2007. That's a store that his brother currently owns, but he had created this entity to take title, and, and it was his brother as the end up, ended up acquiring the business. So, but these- It never had a license. It never had a license. Mega Liquor never had a liquor license. No. Did it ever have a, a storefront? Uh, I, I think his brother still runs a store there, but under his brother's name. With Did Kevin they, doesn't have any interest in that. Okay. So of all of the entities listed on the corporations division that are attached to Kevin, you are yep. stating on your oath that you've identified on this form every liquor establishment for which you've had a, either a financial, a direct, or an indirect interest? Yes, yes, you've yes, Mr. Yes, yes, Lang? And you've also listed any of the places for all of these entities for which there was any disciplinary action? That, and then we stand by the disclosure of the dis disciplinary action. And also that you, you don't have any other establishments that you own outside of Massachusetts, do you? Uh, no, no ma'am. Did you have any establishments outside of Massachusetts? No, ma'am. Okay. okay. I'll go back to the packet. And for just for the um, members of the public attending, um, can you just go over the financial transaction that's involved here? And then you're doing a pledge of um, stock yes, in and license as well, which we, we have to take a vote on. Yes, ma'am. Um, the total, uh, the price for the business is, uh, is $875,000. Um, with the approximate value of the inventory that will be taken at or about the time of closing of 500000 for a total purchase price of $1.375. Um, 
Sonaraya is going to take back two notes, one a 10-year promissory note for $475,000, and then the inventory, which is estimated to be at about uh, $500,000, will be the subject of a second five-year promissory note. And that's the pledge that we're looking to um, pledge the license in the event that it is transferred back to Sonaraya to secure the performance of each of those notes. So. Of the 1.3, he's going to be putting in oh good uh, about uh, about 375 in cash, financing 500 or 4 475, uh, and then financing the inventory. Okay. All right. The source okay. of the and I can say the source of the cash that is uh, that he's using here comes from a real estate investment that he had in Mar in uh, Marblehead where he sold a house on one Thompson Road. I was involved in both the acquisition and the sale of that. Yes. Okay. And does anyone have any other questions? Mr. Gilberto, all set? Yep. Okay. I am going to open it up to anybody, members of the public attending wish to speak in favor or in opposition to this and i don't see anyone <coughs> nobody in the chats okay so seeing none i'll close that portion of the meeting any further discussion from the board? None. All right. Do we have a motion? Yes, Madam Chair, I move to approve the transfer of license and pledge of license of Paradise R2 Inc., DBA New England Beverage, 160 Main Street. Second. I have a motion by Mr. Studo and a second by Mr. O'Leary. Any <coughs> further discussion? Uh, Madam Chair? In, yes, Mr. O'Leary. Just uh, two things. One is I want to, um, uh, if there's an affirmative vote here, but either way, I'd like to um, uh, thank Mr. Sonny Ray for being a good member of the business community here for a number of years and uh, wish him well going forward with his new family, uh, extended family or expanded family. And again, want to wish um, Kevin and his partner here uh, much success going forward. Again, we need good, vibrant members of the business community here. I hope they succeed. Thank you so much, Mr. O'Leary. Okay, I have a motion by Mr. Studo to approve, a second by Mr. O'Leary. Any further discussion? Seeing none. Mr. O'Leary. Aye. Mr. Walner. Aye. Mr. Studo. Aye. Mrs. Gonzalez. Aye. Emmanuel Pelli is I. Okay, thank you. All thank set. You. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of uh, of the select board, and um, thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for everything. Thank you. Thank you. Everyone. Next order of business is an eight o'clock show cause hearing on Route 28 Lucky Mart. And this is, as the members know, a continuation of the show cause hearing that we previously continued. Uh, Mr. Gilberto, I don't know if you have um, <laughs> dates of that. I'm trying to find the hearing notice. Stay with me one moment, Madam Chair. Yes, I'm scrolling down to that too. We're probably, we're probably doing the same. <laughs> Beginning on page 92. Beginning on page 91, actually, of the file. Madam Chair, through you, the hearing was originally scheduled for November 16th, yep. and it was uh, rescheduled to this evening's meeting for 8 o'clock p.m. December 7th. And do we have anybody in attendance from Route 28 Lucky Mart? Is Mr. Patel 
here and he we did receive a notice of representation from attorney delaney is attorney delaney uh, madam, with madam chief madam chair sean delaney good, good evening good evening good uh, board members uh for some reason i can't get my video to uh come up but you know what I look like, I think most of you, and you're probably better off not seeing my face. I just want to see, want to see, what, your, I just want to see what your COVID outfit is. <laughs> well, I'm perfectly dressed this evening, Mr. O'Leary. <laughs> I'm like, I was the last time I was before this board. Um, so I'm here on behalf of Lucky Mott and Mr. Patel. Mr. Patel's here. He's on a telephone line. So we are here, and I know that I had previously in my discussions with Mr. Gilberto on Friday, and I wish to thank him for endeavoring to get me all the materials re related to this hearing on Friday afternoon. So uh, I'm going to withdraw my motion to continue the hearing and we'll proceed this evening. If the okay. board's ready to proceed. Thank you. Excellent. Okay, so now we are, I believe we we were joined by our, I could be wrong, but I think we were joined. Oh, there you are, Chief Murphy. <laughs> so, Terry, now we can see you. <laughs> So, Chief, if you don't mind, I know you did a little bit of an explanation to us at the first um, the first show cause hearing. So, if you don't mind explaining why we're here, what the violations are, and a little bit of the background for us again. Oh, you're on mute. He's muted. No, I can't. Oh, you're muted, Chief. How's that? Sorry Perfect. about that. Um, on Sunday, October 18, 2020, Detectives Michael Mara and Paul Lucci, uh, with the assistance of a 20-year-old confidential person, performed alcohol compliance checks throughout the town of North Reading at our various liquor license establishments. Um, they're done periodically in an effort to reduce the availability of alcohol to people under the age of 21. These checks are done in compliance with the training and guidelines set forth by the uh, Massachusetts Alcoholic Beverage Control Commission, and as part of those guidelines, we notify the public of the compliance checks through electronic and paper media. We had done that three days prior to this um, to this alcohol compliance check. Um, we did issue all the um, pertinent paperwork to the underage person and got all signatures um, and have all that on on file. Um, so on Sunday, October 18th, an alcohol compliance check was completed at 202 North Street, which is um, Lucky Mart. Um, after that um, compliance checks, I received a report that there was a violation of permitting an illegality on the licensed premises, to wit, a violation of Mass General Law Chapter 138, Section 34, which is sale or delivery of an alcoholic beverage to a person under the age of 21. According to Detective Mara's report, the underage person was instructed to attempt to purchase a six pack of Bud Light beer. Uh, the person was instructed to leave the premises if a state identification card or license was requested by the seller. The officers monitored that person, the underage person, um, and approximately one later, the underage person exited the store with a black shopping bag containing a six pack of Bud Light bottles. Um, the underage person told the officers they had just purchased purchased the beer from the only male that was working at the cash register inside of Lucky Mart. The officers then went inside. They identified themselves as North Reading police officers um, and informed the male that was working uh, at the cash register, who was identified as Peta Bonaldine, um, that he had just sold alcohol to a minor. Um, that clerk did respond that he said the person said they were 21 years old. The store manager was nearby and said that the uh, Mr. Thornadine did indeed card the person and he said he would replay the cameras for them. Um, the detective told the manager that the person was not in any possession of any identification as all possessions were removed as part of the ABCC guidelines. Uh, a violation notice was issued to the establishment and we have it on file. Mr. Thornadine was advised that the establishment would be receiving a notice that from the town of North Reading regarding this violation. Um, and he was asked uh, that the violation be written to an other employee in the store. He further stated that he wasn't an employee of the store. He was just a friend who stopped by to watch the game and had only conducted one transaction while the other employee was cleaning. 
The detective noted that uh, when he entered the store to speak with the clerk, Mr. Thornaldine was standing behind the counter at the cashier's position, which is restricted to the public by a swinging door. Um, the clerk was further advised to follow all governing laws and regulations regarding the selling and distribution of alcohol. Uh, we did follow up the next day with our um, with our DFC grant coordinator and one of our detectives to determine whether or not um, Mr. Thornaldine had a responsible service certificate. Um, the goal was to learn um, learn if if the seller did have that certificate uh, at the time of the sale. So they did when they visited the Lucky Mart. Mr. Vimal Patel, who was identified as the owner, was working. The detective explained that they were following up on that October 18th violation. Detective Lucci had asked the server if the server that day, Mr. Patathonald Dean, had his training since he said he was not an employee. Mr. Patel said that Mr. Thonald Dean was, in fact, an employee and was on his training yesterday and had his certification. Uh, our DFC coordinator uh, requested to see the certification as part of her audit, and Mr. Patel told her that he would produce it at his hearing. Um, they, then, they then said that they would be reporting that to me, um, and then he pulled up a responsible server training certificate for Mr. Thonaldine, uh, which was on his phone. Um, it was dated to expire October 18, 2023. It appeared that the certification was completed sometime after the violation on October 18, 2020. That's a summary of the facts. Okay, do, do the members have any questions of uh, Chief Murphy with regard to the summary of the facts? No, pretty, pretty straightforward. Um, Mr. Delaney on, on behalf of the licensee. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, first, on behalf of my client, I'd like to state to uh, the board, as well as Chief Murphy, that my client recognizes that a license to sell alcohol in anywhere in the Commonwealth, particularly in North Reading, is a privilege. It's not a right. And he's very disturbed, not only regarding the incident that occurred, which is very serious, uh, but also the fact that he's recently learned, upon my review of the documentation received, from the town administrator of uh, the lack of truthfulness of his employee and his manager uh, mm -hmm. upon the arrival of Officer Myra and Detective Lucci. Uh, he's considering now what disciplinary action he's taking as an employer against the two employees as a result of the totality of the incident, uh, but most importantly, the lack of truthfulness of both uh, employees. So that's something that's ongoing internally, uh, but uh, I want to assure this board and the chief that disciplinary actions will be taken on an employer or employee uh, level uh, soon uh, following this hearing. Uh, I'd like to point out that my client has operated this business for about two plus years in North Reading. I am aware of one prior incident, uh, but also if the board is not aware, my client operates several other locations uh, throughout the Commonwealth, uh, none of which have uh, uh, a liquor license, but they do have uh, tobacco licenses, and he's never been in violation in any other uh, establishment. It, there was never any disciplinary action anywhere at all in any of the other establishments that he uh, owns or operates. And there's probably, um, in my count, there's at least six or seven other establishments that he owns or operates throughout the Commonwealth. Uh, and he's been in business for in over uh, nearly five years in all these locations. So it's a significant period of time, I point that out. Um, and also, uh, we're not disputing, obviously, the facts of this case at all. Uh, however, uh, I'd ask the, the board in its consideration here, knowing that there's been one prior incident, but also considering the fact that uh, Mr. Patel, uh, throughout the whole pandemic that we're enduring, has never shut his business down, was able to operate it as a service to the community, uh, and has done so not only with the employees that he has, but as the chief had indicated on the following, on the follow-up day by his department, uh, Mr. Patel himself was uh, working in the establishment. So he's a positive contributor to the community in that regard, 
He employs several people, not only here in North Reading, but also throughout the Commonwealth. So I hope the court, uh, this the court, the, the board would consider that in its ultimate decision-making process here and having some familiarity with what the board may do in an incident like this, I would ask the board to, if it's going to suspend the license, what I think it will do, suspend it for no more than three days. And I'd ask the board to also uh, consider not doing this over either the Christmas or the New Year's holiday. I know the board has been pretty consistent in what they do in terms of time period, when they do it. But again, going back to the times that we live in right now, um, this will be a significant impact upon the financial wherewithal of this particular business if, in fact, it, the board makes a decision to suspend this license for either the Christmas or the New Year's holiday time period. So, therefore, I'd ask the board if it's going to suspend the license, suspend it prior to December 20th or have the end date no later than December 20th, or postpone the suspension of any license to no earlier than the Martin Luther King weekend. And again, uh, on behalf of my client, uh, I wish to express his apologies to uh, Chief Murphy, this board, and the community of North Reading for the actions of uh, his and two employees on that particular day. Thank you. Okay, questions of uh, my colleagues. Mr. O'Leary, any questions? I have no questions at this point. Okay. I may have Ms. comments when you're ready for comment, but. <laughs> when we're ready for comment, sure. Mr. Uh, Mr. Walner, any questions? Um, I guess I'm not sure, because uh, we've gone through this once with them before, and now we're on the second round. I'm not sure what our precedent has been in the past, so maybe that's in the comments section, but that's what I'm curious to know. Okay. Mrs. Gonzalez, any questions? Do, the does, herring? Yeah, does um, Lucky Mart have the software installed there that they check the IDs with? I believe they do. Mr. Patel, who's on the telephone conference line, can uh, enlighten the board as to the exact um, software he has. Uh, for his employees to check IDs. Mr. Patel. I mean, obviously you have to ID first to be able to use that, but I'm just curious to know if you have it. Yes, Mr. Patel? we do have us ID scanner at our location. And in the fact at this point in this world we are living at this point, we after we catching like if we're scanning in our system or any systems, the kids are become so smart at this point. They're using the photos of they are using someone else as barcode, matching the fake ID. If you scan it, there is a no way you can figure out. And in this pandemic, if we ask someone to get their ID in our hand, people are little like in this pandemic, they are like little scared to give the ID in the hand. But still, we verify over in our hand and we doing the visual checking because of pandemic. So Mr. Patel, it, I can clarify that a little bit. Uh, so what you're saying in light of, I'm not putting words in your mouth, but I just want to be so you are clear to this board that what you're saying is during the pandemic, if someone comes in with a valid ID, but they're wearing a mask, it may scan and it may be valid, but you can't be 100% certain with someone wearing a mask if that's the particular person behind the mask. Yes, because we, we, yes. But you do have the software to to we do have software, uh, yes. To the board members question, you do have the software that scans the identifications, correct? Yes, we do have it. Okay. Thank you. Uh, any other Mr. questions? Gonzalez? No, thank you. Mr. Studo? Uh yes. Um just two. One were either well, I guess one employee was new. Um but was the other employee employed during the last uh, violation? And also, what was the disciplinary reaction, if any, of any of the employees during the first uh, last in June, year? In June year? In 2019? Yes. yes. Mr. Patel, you can respond. So the, 
so that employee the who was involved in the last last uh, incident he was there at the present and he was started to give him the training on that day but the, there was incidents happened there was a coffee was spilled outside so he had to go outside to clean up the coffee so while all these incidents happen he said can you take care for two minutes and all on those five minutes everything happened when the cops arrived on that time also that manager was cleaning the coffee counter because there was a coffee was split outside hold on so wait so this excuse me a follow-up so the same manager happened to not be at the counter to back to back am i reading that correctly um so he had to back he had to go out because of there was a coffee was spilled outside and someone instead of someone spill fall off on the floor floor he decided to go outside to clean up and and all these things happened okay but that so this is the same manager for both instances uh, last year and this year i was asking I about last year five. last year no la last year was some last year was someone else and what happened to that any disciplinary reaction on that person that person is already left. Okay, thank you. I guess I'm gonna I'm gonna follow up um, on Mrs. Gonzalez's question to you, Mr. Patel, because it is clear that you you even though you're saying you have this software and you're saying you use it and everybody's crafty and can figure out a way around it, you didn't actually use it this day. There was no card to be ID'd. And when the sale took place, do you acknowledge that? He, I do Madam, acknowledge. Madam Chair, he he does acknowledge that that it was a new employee. No excuses. Just agreeing with the facts as presented by Chief Murphy. That but it, a, it, it doesn't make that doesn't make a difference, Attorney Delaney, if he has a software program there because he's not using it. He's not training the employees on it. That's pretty much the facts here. And well, there, that, well, I would, I would disagree. I would disagree that that's not. That's not I'm not hearing a case. single thing explaining what they're going to do about this. And now they've had two instances of the same exact thing, selling to a minor, in the same exact circumstance where they were notified ahead of time that this was going to happen, and he's still not there. And maybe he's spread thin, like you said. He's got eight other establishments he's busy with. So he's not focusing on North Reading. So maybe he's spread too thin. What is he doing to train employees? What is he going to do not to have this happen again? And we haven't even decided what the measure of a response is going to be. Suspension, revocation, we haven't decided that yet. So this is a second incident, uh, same exact, almost the same exact fact pattern with the same exact excuse. Oh, the IDs are good. They're really good at fooling us. And now we have a mask that's fooling us. But this was one out of multiple, multiple places that were that were the subject of these compliance checks. And, and only two of them had an issue and a sale like this. So, and this one, this is a second incident. So what is he doing to prevent this from happening? I haven't heard a single thing about that. Well, what he's been doing since that time period, you heard the chief indicate that the employee that did the sale was tips, tips trained soon thereafter. And since that time, Mr. Patel himself has been with this employee on multiple occasions while the employee has been working and going through the liquor sales with him. Uh, and in fact, uh, Mr. Patel, there was a lot of, Business information uh, on this, what I'm leading up to is Mr. Patel had shared with me several uh, text messages between himself and this employee following that date and that incident, uh, in which uh, the employee was indicating how he had actually stopped people. Uh, there were invalid IDs uh, that he caught, and also people that came in claiming they had bought there before, saying, hey, you're new, but you know, this, this is what we do. You can sell it to us, and we can sell to those that are underage or without ID following that incident. I can forward those along, but there's some business or corporate information involved. I didn't want to, I think it was appropriate for me to share that. 
but I can tell you the content of those text messages and so forth, uh, that this employee knows now what he needs to do. I don't believe you're going to see again from Mr. Patel or any other employee who's taken steps that no employee is going to be near a register uh, unless they're fully trained, fully certified, and it understands how to use the scanning device and make sure there's no one, no one that purchases alcohol there without first producing a valid ID. He's told me that he doesn't care if someone walks in and someone's 80 years of age, it looks 80 years of age, they're going to be asked for an identification or they won't be served in his uh, establishment by any employee. So those are the things that was done. In response to, it was in response to Mr. Gon Ms. Gonzalez's question regarding, is there a system? And he just wanted to explain, he does have a system, but there is some difficulty, and I know this from other clients, there is some difficulty during this current uh, age that we're in, unfortunately, that there is some difficulty. You may get a valid ID, but it may not be the person that's actually purchasing the, the liquor. That, that's not, he's not making that as an excuse in this instance because it, it doesn't apply, but it's in, in, expla in explaining what sort of scanning device and equipment that he has uh, purchased and installed in his uh, business or operation in North right. So those are the measures he's taken in terms of uh, doing his uh, very best to ensure that this never happens again in this location or any location that he owns or operates. Yes, Mr. I mean, that's, I, I appreciate your explanation of that. If he's allowed to keep his license after this, I appreciate you explaining what steps he's going to take to ensure this. But there's also the, what he said the last time, well, we'll do two forms of ID here. He did no, no ID here. And so I can appreciate taking the steps after the fact, but I'm all, I'd also like to know what he's doing to train his employees not to hinder an investigation like this, basically blatantly lying to the police. That's what they did. So what is he doing about that aspect of this, which I think is, is of course, as serious of a violation, in my opinion, as the sale to the minor. But what is he doing about training the staff on complying with the law regarding liquor licensing? Well, I think it's, I view your comment or question in, in twofold. One, it's what he's doing to train and also uh, what he takes is very serious. And I started with my uh, initial comments to the board regarding uh, his concern of the untruthfulness of the lack of truthfulness of his employees to the investigating officers. And that's what he's contemplating in terms of what he's going to do in terms of an employer employee disciplinary action going forward, which he just learned about this today upon my review of the documentation and uh, then confirming with him. So he hasn't ultimately made a decision, but I suspect that at a minimum, there'll be a suspension, if not a dismissal of one of both employees. Um, obviously recognize it's a very difficult time, um, but no excuse. I mean, no one can accept the, the lack of truthfulness uh, from anyone, particularly in this situation here. Going to uh, your issue about what he's doing in terms of training, I think I've hit on it, but also I'll reiterate and also back up to the facts of the case. Uh, what should not have happened was a new employee being left behind a register without supervision. No matter what had occurred, uh, he knows that the manager probably should have sent this, not probably, definitely should have sent this new employee to clean up whatever spill it may have been and leave the manager behind the cash register. So there's no one, any new employee has to be sufficiently trained uh, with a coworker, with a supervisor for a sufficient period of time before they'll be allowed to operate at the, at the location alone. Uh, and that'll be, it's, it's laid out, that's what he's doing now, that's what he will continue to do and, until he is satisfied that the new employee is educated and knows the proper procedure in the sale of whether it's alcohol or any tobacco products. Okay. He takes this very serious and, he, and as I stated earlier, he knows it's a, this license is all right. This board has every, many, many options right now. Um, 
So he recognizes that. He knows how serious it is, but he's also investing a lot of money and assets into this particular location. He certainly doesn't want to lose this license. I, I can appreciate what you're saying, Attorney Delaney, but you just said that he just found out today about what is what these two individuals did, and this happened October 18th. And I would think based on the series of what happened, he'd want to get in there and interview them immediately and get to the bottom of it, talk to the chief, figure out what exactly happened and how to prevent it in the future. Well, well until he had counsel, he didn't know he didn't know he had a right to request all the documentation that I had requested from the town administrator once I was retained. So he wasn't aware of what was the contents of the report until I reviewed those reports and then discussed them with him. Okay. Any other questions or yes, Chief Chief Murphy, I can see you have your hand up. So I just had a clarification. I, I have my report from 2019 um, to Mr. Studo's question. So the clerk at that time was Marmik Patel, and the clerk was different this time, but the manager was of Bimal Patel. I'm not sure um, if Marmik is still working or not, but that was the 2019 case. Okay. And I had one more one more comment i guess um as part of we, we all we do enforcement but we also do education as part of our prevention efforts and um, our dfc coordinator has sent a letter back in june to all liquor license establishments essentially because of covid and, and people wearing masks um asking them to rely on their tips training which there's a lot of other techniques to use um, you know questioning their date of birth zip codes um so there are other ways to determine whether or not the ID that the person's actually possessing is is them. Um, you can ask a lot of questions because there's a lot of identifying information and most likely they won't remember everything if it's a fake ID. Thank you, Chief. Uh, any other questions of the members of the board? Okay. So I think for for seeing no further questions, I think at this point, prior to uh, moving on action, I think we do a, a finding of facts, and I can kick it off for my colleagues. Um, that essentially this licensee number one, the licensee was notified of the compliance check in advance uh, by electronic paper and media methods on October 18th. 2020, the compliance check occurred at the establishment. Uh, the licensee sold alcohol to a minor in violation of Massachusetts General Laws, Chapter 138, Section 34, which is a violation of liquor law. The individual, the clerk that sold the alcohol, did not check an ID. The individual who then claimed to be the manager said that the in the clerk did card the purchaser um, that individual was actually not um, the clerk was apparently they then told the investigator that that individual was not working there this attempting to try to confuse the investigator um, so there was a lack of truthfulness on the part of the employee and the manager and essentially hindering that investigation by trying to mislead or provide false information. And at this establishment, there is also a prior incident of sales to a minor um, that occurred for which this licensee's license was suspended for three days. Um, and that prior incident of sale to a minor occurred with the fake ID occurred June 8th, 2019. I don't know if anybody wants to add to that. No? Okay. Do you want to discuss, Mr. Astudo? So, uh, it's something, well, uh, you never want to see a business in a situation where they may lose revenue, but in this case, I mean, it, it's just a couple comments. Um, one time's a mistake, two times is a pattern, three times is a habit. So I feel like this board has to consider that this can't be a habit. Um, I've also seen that uh, learning from my experience, 
outside of talk and especially in this country the one pay the one way people really learn is when it hits their wallet and they learn in a hurry so i do think that uh it, it just really that the second time offense and then just seemingly that two years in a row the person in charge was doing a remedial task while the violation was occurring I mean, when you put everything together, I mean, I'm one for spin and I like a good story, but it just, when you add everything up, it just really adds up to the fact that we can go around all night. But in my opinion, um, uh, some sort of penalty um, should be imposed. I, I don't agree. I wouldn't say revocation. I don't know for that point, you know, I'm kind of new to this kind of process, but I'd say that um the one thing i'll add as much as it would hurt it's got to be done when it counts and i think that i mean it, it's going to count in december so uh, you know that's my opinion that i you know i, I think that it, it's something it's it's unfortunate but at the same time it's something where everyone will agree that if we are sitting here in a couple of years and it's third time's a charm it, it's it's just gonna we're all gonna look bad so that's just my opinion that i think that uh you know any suspension that would happen if there's going to be one and that's the pleasure of the board as you like to say a lot of the times uh madam chair i think should happen in december and you know i'll i'll just wait to see what other members think on you know uh on their take and then maybe even chief murphy i don't know if it's him or the t whoever would recommend of what they would think is an appropriate length of time. So that's my comment. I don't know if there's any history you can impart on that, uh, Mr. Gilbert, or if there if there has been a previous establishment like this that's had successive violations like this and what what the I guess penalty was. Sure. So Madam Chair, can you hear me okay? Yes. Yeah, we, we've uh, we've assembled a spreadsheet of this information that I know was not in the uh, the board's packet um, for this evening. It was updated uh, today with um, the more current information. And so the you know looking back, you know it ranges where they, when there's been a second um, a second violation, there's been you know sequential three-day violation so the first violation would be a three-day and the second violation would also be a three-day there's an instance where there was a substantial amount of time where somebody was up to a third violation but there was like a nine-year period in between um, the best example i can find it would appear to be a five-day suspension um, and that's uh, between a 2002 uh, suspension at christopher's market for three days and then a subsequent um, five-day suspension in 2007. So it, it looks like the board has done a, a you know a, a, a three-day suspension. It's also done a seven-day suspension for a first-time violation as well for Convenience Plus in 1995. So there isn't a really crystal clear history, but it does appear that we've gone to five days when there's been a, a second violation, um, you know, under the common, the same ownership. But the, I, I, to be clear, you know, this is more uh, the practice. Uh, the board has been very clear about not having a policy, and I think it's historically taken each violation um, on its on its merits and considered any any factors, including any aggravating factors. Mm -hmm. I think that's a good testament to the to this to this board over the years that they've only had those few number of successive incidences. You know, so. Uh, Mrs. Gonzalez, did you have your hand up? Yeah, I just wanted to make a, a few comments um, from the last time. Um, again, there was no carding done at all. Um, and the miner had made a statement that that place had a reputation of not carding. Um, that was in in the um, notes here so um i've actually spoken to a reliable source that is of age now but said that was the place to go um when you weren't so 
with that in mind. It, and then looking at what we did last time, because it was first offense, the attorney asked us if we would not um, suspend over Columbus Day and rather do Labor Day. Or, or do it over Columbus Day rather than Labor Day, and and we did that. Um, so that was being kind to to him. And then he promised, in looking at the notes, that anyone under 35 would be carded. So now now it's 84, I think. Um, Attorney Delaney said. <laughs> so I mean, there's you know, like Mr. Studo said, you know, this is now. What a habit. Pattern. A pattern, a pattern, pattern that we don't want to have. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Anything else? No. Yes, Mr. Walner. Yeah, I'm. I'm also reviewing the same notes. It's at in, on page one hundred and three of our packet. Um, I actually said that uh, Mr. Walner stated the licensee should work together with the police department to come up with a better practice. Obviously, that was ignored. Um, so I am probably uh, want to go a little heavier on how to do this. I think a five-day is, is starting to feel like, based on what Mr. Roberto has said, is that we should be looking at a five-day suspension. And I don't think it should be um, before or after the holidays. As a matter of fact, I think it should be right in the middle of it because I think it should be painful. I think it's too close to what happened last year. I think there's been, you know, misleading and lying going on. And, you know, apparently they, they weren't um, paying attention a year ago. You got to pay attention now. We just can't go another round with this. So I think it has to hurt. Mr. All set, Mr. Walner? Yes, thank you. Okay. Mr. Was it Mr. O'Leary? Okay, Mr. Leary. I, I wasn't sorry. I'm the only one. Yeah, sorry. Um, again, I've been here for a while uh, as far as the board and the different actions that we've taken over the course of time. And we take into consideration, uh, again, whether it's the uh, same ownership and whether it's, and again, the, the, the number of circumstances where it's been the same ownership in a short period of time has been few and far between, if at all. And there, there hasn't been anyone that's been, that I recall, you know, within one year or basically a year of each other <clears throat> under the same ownership. And, and part of what we looked at in the past and considered is, you know, whether it be progressive discipline, uh, what the extenuating circumstances were, uh, how cooperative they were, how, you know, they came in with the hat in their hand and, and admitted as this uh, license he has to this evening, you know, all those things were taken into consideration. And then uh, I was involved in the hearing where there was a seven day suspension. Again, circumstances were, uh, substantially different than the first time and again that time period was probably five or six years difference but uh, but again same ownership you know in, in this particular case I think what's uh, compelling again is the um, lack of oversight uh, of, the, of the new employee uh, the lack of um, honesty and uh, forthrightness in relation to uh, being approached by the police department as to when it occurred and it's it's somewhat disturbing. And again, the time frame is disturbing with about 14 months, 15 months difference. You know, so, um, you know, I would be in, in inclined to move forward with, with some progressive discipline, not revocation, but progressive discipline above the three days. Um, you know, I'd be in favor of a five day suspension. Um, as far as the time frame that goes along with it, um, again, I, I also recognize that, you know, these are very, difficult and trying times for businesses to um, survive. These are not normal times. Uh, so I'd be receptive to, to looking at something outside of the holiday, uh, but definitely a five day suspension. So again, my suggestion would be uh, the 16th, 17th, 18th, 19th and 20th of December, uh, five day suspension. And again, if I see them back here, I wouldn't, rule out the contemplation of a revocation so they have to take it seriously and this license is worth something obviously to the licensee and it but it's also um, important for us as the licensing board to take it seriously and we always have as far as selling to minors and um, we need to impart upon them the 
the importance of being forthright and straightforward with our police department and enforcement officials. And it's it's important again to stress that this wasn't done without notice. So that this is what I have a hard time understanding when we always had a licensee before us, when they've been notified in writing, they've been notified in the newspaper uh, that you know it's going to take place over a certain period of time, and they're still not ill prepared and fall into the trap. So anyway, it's uh, well, I'm in favor of a five day suspension. My suggestion would be the 16th through the 20th. Um, if the board is inclined to do some other dates, that's fine too. Okay. Mrs. Gonzalez, do you have your hand up? Yeah, um, I, I just don't feel like, I, I mean, saying that the business has been hurt during the pandemic, I mean, this isn't a restaurant. I, I feel like liquor stores have done better during the pandemic because, you know, people are home and and drinking more. But I feel like, I don't feel like they probably have been that hurt. Not, it's not like the restaurant um, business. So I, I would be fine over the holiday. Just in relation to that, Madam Chair, you know, the, yeah, this is a beer and wine license, a convenience store. It's not a full-fledged liquor store. And again, this particular establishment is, is surrounded less than a quarter of a mile north and a quarter of a mile south is full-fledged liquor stores too. So, I mean, as far as, I don't know what percentage of the business is, is beer and wine for this uh, this individual and nor do I care to know. Uh, but again, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's a matter of convenience. People go there rather than the liquor store. Again, a quarter mile north and a quarter mile south is a, a full liquor store with far more selections. Um, but anyway, that being said, Okay, so it sounds like at least there's a consensus without speaking for the board, but it sounds like there is a consensus with regard to uh, more, not a revocation, but uh, an increase from not three days, but five days. It sounds like a five day suspension is what I believe the majority is contemplating and also the dates and mr o'leary has proposed dates that carry over a weekend that's just before christmas um and mrs Gon gonzalez i think you're thinking of di a different date than that but uh, do we have at least a consensus on that on those dates that we have mr o'leary proposed those mrs gonzalez do you have another proposal of those five days um, or are you are you all right with those? So that's uh well, that's. I mean, uh, I'll go with the consensus of the board, but um, I I just I just feel like if we're gonna make a statement, then let's make a statement. I mean, we're not gonna revocate, so let's make it hurt. I mean, this is the second time in a year. It's um, it, it's been clear that they're they're not even carding. Never mind them never mind the scanning and and the mask and you don't know like first you got to ask for the id before you even deal with those situations so they're not even iding um and and we've heard that there's a reputation there that that's a place to go you know if you want to get some underage liquor so I, I think a statement needs to be made here so i would i would throw out dates of either the 20th through the 24th or the 27th through the 31st. <laughs> one, one leads up to Christmas and one leads up to New Year's. We're going to do five days. And I'm probably more in favor of the 27th through the 31st. Mr. Strudo, any thoughts on that? Uh, on the day, whatever, I mean, on the number of days, I mean, I, I think, yeah, being, uh, just speaking from personal experience and knowing how people buy, I think the date is more important than the days. You okay. know, the next, because I can tell you that you take New Year's Eve weekend, that's going to be more than any other five days you can pick. So I'm saying that if we want to be, you know, again, it's not about being punitive. It's about just showing that 
also others that this is what happens. I mean, it's it's a it's kind of a big deal in this instance that I know it's repeat offender and but we also we we have enough problems without worrying about you know a drunk 18 year old behind the wheel like that's just like it's like the cherry on top to everything else going on you know and i'm not saying that would happen but i'm just you know kind of so i'd say that three or five i'm with both to me i i think you know maybe i don't even want to call it a compromise but maybe something else we could consider just to show that you know no one's trying to hurt someone during covid is that maybe you do three days but you do it at the absolutely worst time for a business which would be new year's eve weekend including new year's day okay. like i'm saying so i think i think we're already at i i was actually looking for your input on the days i think we're already a consensus of of five days being the suspension so, okay then then i would um, say we are i would at say three to five days but the other three members we just heard from are at five days for a suspension for this second offense within a year's time. So now we're just oh, trying to point what days and and just like we would do with the initial suspension, we do that over a holiday. We typically do that over a holiday weekend. So now uh, Mr. O'Leary's proposed the holiday weekend, the weekend right before the holiday. Mr. Wallace zoned us in on the weekend right before the New Year's holiday. So um it's uh i was just wondering if you had a thought on that or it doesn't even matter i mean that's the thing this is punitive it is a punishment for what the violation well, then, is. i mean if we're gonna do to me it's whether it's three or five though i think it should include the whole weekend so i think it should be right. from the 28 29 30 31 what, like whatever whatever the five days is where it's entirety of that Friday to Sunday is in it because neither of those times that we just said include the Saturday Sunday after which are big days. So that's what I, I would say. Madam Chair. Mr. Mr. Gilberto. Just uh, I would note for the board when considering the calendar that the establishments are required to be closed by law on December 25th. Mm -hmm. and I, the chief can confirm for you, actually, Madam Chair, you could probably confirm. I think they may also need to be closed on January 1st, although I don't know if that's changed. When all else fails, I Google. Think I think you're muted, Chief. You're muted. Oh, no, so you're not. I, I'm not anymore. So I get notification on Thanksgiving and Christmas, but I have not gotten notification on January 1st yet. Okay. So they are closed on Thanksgiving, and which is passed, obviously, in Christmas. Okay. For some reason, I thought liquor stores were closed on, you know, New Year's Day, but I might be wrong. Uh, I'm, I, this could be wrong, but I'm reading something where they are open. This last year they were open on New Year's Day, so I don't know if they would change the rules for this year coming up. But again, don't quote me on it. I'm just looking from a, a last year. I, and I, re I recall that as well from a previous year. That, so it may be that they are open, but we just we've not been formally notified by the ABC. Speech. Well, since we know Christmas is going to be closed for sure, then maybe the day is the 22nd to the 27th, because then it's the then it's the 22nd, 23rd, 24th, 25 doesn't apply, and then we have 26th and 27th. So that gets us through Christmas plus the end of the, plus after that weekend. I don't know if that would be considered a six-day suspension. I don't think it is. I think it's it's still a five-day because effectively you can't sell on one of the days. Okay. Okay, so now we have so 22nd to the 27th. <laughs> now we have three different. All right, so we have three different proposals. We've got Mr. O'Leary's, Mr. Walner's. Oh, Mr. Walner, you gave us two. So, so let's just I'll move this off. forward. I'll just, I'll just stick with the 22nd to the 27th, <laughs> Mr. O'Leary. You tell you what, Madam Chair, I'm going to make a motion. If, if it gets a second, it gets a second. If it doesn't, it doesn't. If it gets a second, you can put it to a vote and people can All right. 
Uh, Madam Chair, I move to suspend for five consecutive days the package store all alcohol license at Route 28 Lucky Mart, 202 North Street on, uh, let's see, on uh, Wednesday, December 16th through Sunday, December 20th. Do, 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 do. Uh, and the license that the license must be delivered to the North Reading Police Department at the close of business on December 15th and picked up at the police station on December 21st. I have a motion. Do I hear a second? Hearing none, motion fails. Do I hear another motion? Um, yeah, sure. I'll try one. <laughs> <laughs> Madam Chair, I move to suspend for five consecutive days the package store, all alcohol license of Route 28 Lucky Mart 20, 202 North Street on, sorry, sorry, I don't screw up the date, so we have to do this over. Sorry, my calendar X'd out. Okay. Are looking before New Year's? That's the 27th. On, on Tuesday, on Tuesday, December 29th to to Sunday, December, uh, so Sunday, January 3rd. That'll be and at the January. Sorry. No. Oh, That's oh yeah, because you're, excuse me. So on Wednesday, December 30th to Sunday, the January uh, 3rd, and that the license must be delivered to the North Reading Police Department at the close of business on Tuesday, December 29th, and picked up at the police station on Monday, January 4th at 8 a.m. Second. I have a motion and a second and any further discussion on the motion. I mean, I would like to say there is there is merit to, to having this suspension effectuated sooner than that rather than later, which I think was the premise behind Mr. O'Leary's choice of dates. But we have a motion and a second, so we'll take a vote on that. Mr. O'Leary. Uh, before just on discussion, uh, again, uh, my, my, sorry. Preference, yeah, my preference would be to, again to have it uh, sooner rather than later. And I think as far as uh, the punitiveness and the message that's being sent uh, over a holiday, you know, the first, um, uh, again, is a message that we can send. But I don't think, I think the message is the same. The uh, the impact is uh, still five days and significant, um, and it sends a message to this licensee and all licensees. And I, I'm not looking to be as punitive as, as some of the other board members here, but uh, it appears as though there there may be a, a majority here. So I, I will reluctantly support it. But again, I want the record to show that I think it uh, the earlier dates as previously proposed uh, would be would be sending the same message. So the the also the impact would be the same if if uh, the board were to consider the dates that Mr. Waller proposed, which is to the consecutive days that the establishment's open of 22, 23, 24, 26, 27, where it's not open on the, it's not gonna be considered a suspension on a day that it's not allowed to sell anyway, but consecutive business days would be the dates that Mr. Warner proposed that kind of send the same message, but it's sooner than waiting until the, you know, the, the beginning of January or the end of the month and the beginning of January. So I, I, I agree in, in premise to what you were trying to do, Mr. O'Leary, proposing it soon, sooner, as soon as, you know, the notice letter goes out. So, all right, so we have those dates proposed. Mr. Walner, did you make the motion, Mr. Walner? Because now- No, I, I did. Mr. Studo's motion. Mr. Studo's motion and a second by Mrs. Gonzalez. Okay, on the motion, any further discussion? Um, I, go ahead. Uh, <laughs> just to add, again, and, and, and Mr. O'Leary, I, I understand what you're, I'm not trying to be, like I said, it's not, it's not a punitive, but it's more that what I've learned is that no matter what's going on in the world, business owners, because I'm one of them, 
we don't learn till it hits the pocket. And then we learn in a hurry, in our real hurry, faster than this board can ever teach them and faster than uh, Chief uh, Murphy can ever uh, educate. So that's why I'm saying that I'd rather, and I understand that we want to do it sooner rather than later. However, I'd rather get it done right than get it done quickly. So that's all I wanted to add. Okay, Mr. Gonzalez, did you have anything else for deliberation? No. All right. Sorry about most. Sorry if I moved to do a second by Mrs. Gonzalez. Mr. O'Leary. Aye. Mr. Walner. No. No. Mrs. Gonzalez. Gonzalez. <laughs> Is it discussions over? Discussions over. Discussions over. And we're taking the vote. Okay. So if you, it's okay. 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 Mr. Gilberto, can you, is there a way for you to stop that echoing? I'm going to try to mute everybody. Madam Chair, you are on mute. I can't hear it now. I can't hear the, I can't hear the feedback. So the motion carries the suspension is going to take effect for five it's a five day suspension um and the, it'll be for 29 30th 31st first and second i had those dates correct right okay mr studo are you raising your hand sorry i was muted no i i corrected the motion because someone pointed out i did six days by mistake it's december it's Wednesday, December 30th until uh, January, uh, Sunday, January the 3rd. So that's the five days. I'm sorry. That, that was my, that's my error. I apologize. Okay. Okay. So um, thank you, Attorney Delaney. We appreciate your coming to step forward and proceed on the hearing. And we hope that this, we don't have to see you again in this capacity. Although we enjoy seeing and interacting with you, we don't want to see you again on this one. And could you just explain the, you will you can explain to the licensee. I think he's, he may be gone. No, he's still here. Uh, oh, okay. Thank you all. You have safe and enjoyable holidays. You yeah. too. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Chief, too, for helping us out with the explanation and information. Thank you. All right. So our next order of business, our next order of business is the 8:30 public hearing on the water rates and capital plan. Just need to get to that. There is a uh, meeting notice in our packet. The Town of North Reading Select Board Water Rates and Capital Plan virtual hearing in accordance with the requirements of sections 191-16 and 191-17 of the Code of North Reading, the Select Board and the North Reading Water Commission will hold the annual water rate and water system capital plan hearings virtually on Monday, December 7th, 2020 at 8.30 p.m. with hearing information on how to the access the hearing via internet and by phone. This is posted by the Select Board and publicized by the Select Board November 25th, 2020 and December 3rd, 2020. Mr. Gilberto. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Um, with us this evening um, are uh, the uh, Acting Director of Public Works, Chris Deming, the Water Superintendent, Mark Clark, and our Consulting Engineer from Wright Pierce, Rob Williamson. Um, you have in your packets the hearing notice. Um, you're, we're also joined by the chairman of the Water Commission, Vincent Ragucci. Thank you for joining us this evening. 
who has provided on behalf of the Water Commission a recommendation relative to the water rate for fiscal year 2021. There's also a pretty detailed uh, presentation that we were intending to go through um, here. And my thought is, uh, if it's uh, okay with folks, I'll uh, lead through the first few slides and then turn it over to the water superintendent. Is that acceptable, Madam Chair? Of course. And I'm going to do my best to try to share my screen. Oh, good. With... Oh, yeah, because my packet, it's, you can't, yeah, you can, it's sideways in the packet. Perfect. So folks see a slide that says water update? Yes. Great. I'm going to try to go quickly through this part. That's okay. So this is a, a description here of various steps that we have been reporting to the board over the past few years associated with our purchase of all of our water from the town of Andover. Um, starting up here in the, um, with the most recent developments, you're all familiar with the administrative consent order and subsequent state approval that we got to buy all of our water. Um, you're aware that we have um, bid out um, and we have, uh, we're in the process of awarding contracts both for the chemical feed stations and for the associated water main improvements on um, North Street. Um, there's also related, there's also, excuse me, independent water main work on Mount Vernon Street that we're going through the process of um, contracting for as well. Um, that Both of those water main projects scheduled to be done um, next construction season, or to be started at the beginning of next construction season. I'll just note that there are a couple of projects that we anticipate requesting funding for in the future. One is for water work on um, the northern area of Main Street um, between uh, roughly Burroughs Road and North Street. And then there's also a secondary area that we're calling uh, Southern Main Street, which is um, further south along Main Street as well. Um, those are areas that have previously been identified for improvements and um, for which we'll, we'll, we will be um, looking to try to um, take some of the contingency funding available for the scheduled North Street and chemical feed work and to dedicate it to the Northern Main Street project, but we may require a subsequent, subsequent appropriation, which we expect to be submitted as part of the capital improvement planning process for fiscal year 2022. And this is just a quick graphic. So the areas in red are the projects for which we have funding in place right now. This is North Street going off of uh, Main Street over to um, the Moose uh, Hill Tank, which is up here, and then North Street over to Lowell Road as well. We're going with the construction of a 12 inch main. Um, you're, this board's familiar with the Main Street chemical feed location, which will be constructed, and there's also a Central Street location, which is just out of view, it looks like, there it is, on the map. And so, just a quick update here, you're aware we have funding for um, this from a state grant through the MassWorks pro program, as well as a town appropriation of $3 million for this project. As I mentioned earlier, we do have a bit of a contingency we're working off of, over a half a million dollars that we hope to be able to dedicate toward that Northern Main Street. Uh, water main construction. This is a very quick overview of where we're at. We're going through the awarding of these contracts right now, and we're looking to get started in uh, late first quarter, early second quarter of 2021. This is the Mount Vernon water main. Those of you who have walked the parade route, you are familiar with the needs over on that street for repaving. And one of the things that has held up repaving has been the replacement of the, um, the water main, which is something that we are similarly looking to do, um, as we mentioned up here in construction year 2021. Um, again, we have independent funding for that through the annual water main appropriation, um, both for um, design and for construction. Um, for this, we have a small contingency as well with some funding that's available um, as a, um, a balance unobligated, which again may similarly be available for that North Main Street project that we identified with any difference being requested to the capital plan. Um, the, the Main Street mains that I'm talking about here, again, the northern one is right here between Burroughs and North Street, and again, the southern one um, starting um, just north of Winter Street and going south, um, all the way south on Main Street. So the reason I just identify that along with these projects is that this is a capital rate, uh, a capital hearing as well. Um, we uh, have funded the sought and we have sought and received funding for water distribution system upgrades for re replacing an excavator and F-350 pickup truck. And for some small capital, it's in the operating budget for fiscal year 21 as well. Those, as the board knows, was approved. they were approved at the fiscal year 2021 
um, town meeting held in June of 2020. Um, and so those funding sources are in place, but we are required under the uh, bylaw to have a, uh, a hearing on them. And so we've included them here. I'm gonna stop for just a moment. I just wanted to provide a quick update with regard to the capital projects. Um, I think most folks are familiar with all of those projects. And if they aren't, I'm happy to answer any questions. If there are no questions, I'll turn it over to Mark Clark, the water superintendent for the actual rate hearing. Do the members have any questions? I don't see any. And to the water superintendent and to Mr. Williamson, did I get everything correct in that, in my quick summary, not to steal your thunder? Yep. Excellent job. <laughs> Thank you for your efforts in putting that together, Mr. Williamson. Uh, with no sure, questions, sir. Madam Chair, um, Mark, are you uh, okay to do the presentation and shall I scroll through it on your behalf? Uh, that'd be fine, sure. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay. So this is obviously the uh, the water rate hearing. Typically, we would hold our water rate hearings uh, in the June time frame. We did not do that this year. Uh, yes, a little bit of technology. So uh, if we could go to that, there's a slide showing just a table of the water rate history over the last 10 years. I just wanted to point out, so we did, I think only Mr. O'Leary was on the board at the time, but back in FY11, we had a, a substantial rate increase in the middle of the year. We actually had a, a little issue setting the tax rate because the water rate or the water enterprise was running in a deficit situation. Uh, we did have money elsewhere to offset that, but we had no town meeting authorization to offset that. So DOR had us take a, uh, a step to make sure we were going to be solvent in the water fund. Uh, so we did, you can see at the top, we had a 4% rate increase at the start of FY11, 9% in the middle of the year, and then 11% at the start of FY12. So fairly substantial 24% rate increase over really one year. Um, followed that up by a couple of years of no rate increase, a 2.5% in FY15. And then you see three years of substantial, an 8%, a 6%, and a 6% in FY 16, 17, and 18. That was when we were first starting to look at the MWRA. We had estimated that there'd be a, a need for about a 40% rate increase over five years to go from what our current rates were in order to be at the, the rate we would need to pay the buy-in cost and begin paying the uh, capital needs to connect to the MWRA. Uh, in FY 18, we really started looking hard at Andover again. Um, we weren't really sure where we were going, so for the last two years and going into this year, we haven't done anything with the rates. So what happens if we generate additional money in the water department is typically we transfer it to the infrastructure stabilization fund. And this is just a history of that fund showing back about eight years, going back to 2012. We had about $375,000 in that fund. Uh, the bold numbers are the numbers we have made transfers into that. We have ended each year in the positive. So we've transferred money into that fund each year of the past eight years. Uh, we have occasionally used that money transferred out for small projects, uh, engineering studies, typically some small capital, things that it didn't make sense to bond on the water rate. So we've, uh, we've, as you can see, there are projects we've taken out. I just would make a note. So on the FY19 retained earnings and the temporary chlorine facility, those two numbers were actually combined together last year at June town meeting. So you actually saw a net 321,173 go into the fund. Um, we actually had 451,000, but we had, as we constructed that temporary chlorine facility on Main Street, we had additional costs that we had no place in the budget to cover those costs. So money came out of the stabilization fund for that. Um, I would just note, so those last two transfers, 451000 in FY19, just under $15,000 last year. That obviously raises the question, what's going on? What happened? Um, and kind of look at the next slide to try to explain that. So we did generate retained earnings of $450,000 in FY19. Uh, going from FY19 into FY20, we did have increases within the budget. These are just expense increases. Um, debt service went up by about 75,000. Personnel went up, indirect costs went up. 
and the budgeted cost to purchase water from Andover went up 125,000. When you add up just those four line items, that's about $228,000 of increased expenses. So there was no water rate increase. Our uh, expenses went up by $228,000. You would expect that $451,000 would have been cut in half basically in FY20 just by the, uh, the increase in expenses. As you're all familiar with, in early January, we tested for PFAS in December, got the results in early January. And upon consultation with MassDEP, we shut our own wells off in uh, early January, began purchasing 100% of our water from Andover. May and June, uh, as you may have heard me say in the past, we saw record high water demands. Um, I don't have a good explanation for that. May wasn't really a drought month. June started to, really started the drought. But in June, we actually saw uh, an increase of 40% in our water demand in June compared to June of the year before. If you ever see a 10% increase in a, a year over year water demand, that's huge. Seeing a 40% increase was off the charts. And I talked to a number of other people in the industry and pretty much everybody was seeing huge increases. Um, we're calling it the COVID effect. We think that people were home, they may not have been able to take vacations. So rather than the money that they might've taken a vacation with, they used to do home improvements. One of the things they could do was you know, water their grass. Um, that did continue the rest of the summer as well. We saw much higher water demands the rest of the summer. But what that did to our costs was, we basically, you know, rather than the budgeted what amount was 125,000 for the second half of the year, we should have spent about $60,000 more in Andover we actually spent $415,000 more for those last six months. So when you add the $415,000, um, half of the budgeted increase and, and the rest of it, it comes up to over $500,000 in um, cost increases uh, for FY20 over FY19. Now we were able to save money in a few areas. Uh, we didn't have to buy chemicals, obviously, if we weren't treating water. We didn't use as much electricity because we're not pumping water from our own sources. So we didn't, you know, if the, the actual number I calculate out is $580,000 in increased costs. Uh, but that basically is where those retained earnings from FY20 were lost. So we're a little bit in the black this year, not in a great situation. Um, I wanted to kind of, so that's kind of looking backwards. Now, where are we this fiscal year? So the budget we submitted, back last December was for not for purchasing 100% of our water from Andover and FY21. Uh, if you might have recall in the past, I've said we wanted to phase that in in over two years after we got our final permits. Um, basically just wean off our own water, get through a couple of summers, make sure the system will operate properly without using our own sources. We kind of went cold turkey off our own sources in January. Um, back in February, we presented something that showed we expected the overage in the uh, purchase water line item to be about $380,000. That's actually increased quite a bit because we purchased so much more water, such a high demand year. So this kind of minimum projected match, maximum projected are kind of worst case and better case scenarios here. So worst case, we're gonna buy half million dollars above our budgeted amount of water from Andover. The better case is that that number drops. There's a huge variation there still. I can't tell you what's gonna happen this May and June, if it's gonna repeat what happened last year or if it's gonna be more of an average type year. Um, again, I don't have a perfect explanation for why that level of increase happened. On the other side, back in February, we said we could expect to generate about $275,000 in savings within the budget between personnel, electric costs, chemical costs, uh, not having to maintain and operate the treatment plants. Looking at it now, I'm, I'm projecting that number is actually going to be about $315,000 to about $400,000. So our budget, our, our actual budget approved at town meetings, about $4.468 million for the water department. That's everything, debt service, indirect costs. Uh, everything, purchase of water, personnel. If you take the overage in the Andover and subtract out the, the savings that's potentially there and add it to the budget, you come up with these adjusted budget, an adjusted budget range. So on the worst case scenario, our expenses are going to total $4.655 million. On the better case scenario, 
they're about 4.5. Either way, we're over our FY21 budget. We will have to come to town meeting in June and ask for you know an adjustment to the budget. That's that's going to be a given, just because we're only authorized at this point to spend that that actual budgeted amount. Collections, because we've been selling water, we have we're having a fairly good year of collections. Obviously, if it's the year that we we're we're selling the most water, we expect to collect pretty good too. So projecting collections for the entire fiscal year works out to about four point six one five million dollars. That's independent of cost, so it's either way, it's the same number. If we take the adjusted budget and subtract out the, or take the projected collections and subtract out the adjusted budget, we come up with the potential of a negative about $40,000 deficit, or on the better case scenario, we could actually be generating $111,000 in retained earnings. So what does that mean? We're not looking to run a deficit situation. That's never a good situation. Um, so I've shown what are the options. The options are basically we could do nothing, which is basically the 0% rate increase. Again, that gives us a potential deficit. It also, if things work to our advantage, we work out in a, a positive situation. And I've just shown incrementally what each half percent increase on the water rates applied to just the last six months billing for this year would do to that potential deficit or potential surplus. And you can, I hope you can see this at about two and a half percent is where we would break even. Two and a half percent generates just about that, that uh, $40,000 deficit. Um, the other option is, I, I probably shouldn't include the Stickney Fund here because I don't know that the Stickney Fund can be used for this purpose, but we do have, as what's noted above, we have about over two and three quarter million dollars in our infrastructure stabilization fund. Um, my understanding of that is it can be used for two purposes. One would be for capital projects. So if we had something, a $2 million project, we didn't want to impact the rates at all. We could go to that fund, get authorization to borrow $2 million out of that fund to fund a capital project. The other thing it can be used for is offsetting the need for rate increases. Um, I don't believe the Stickney Fund can be used to offset rate increases, but you, Stickney Fund could be used for capital projects as well. So you can see right now we have about $2.9 million between those two funds. Um, I, before we get into a discussion, I did just wanna kind of take a look at what am I projecting going forward? Um, again, I'm not sure why FY or calendar year 2020 was such a year of high water demand. It was a drought year, but it was way beyond anything we've seen in the past. Um, I'll just make the comment that if it hadn't been such a high demand year, this situation would be much worse. The potential deficit would be much greater and the uh, potential for generating retained earnage would, would, would be much less. Um, I have no reason to expect that the coming summer will be the same. This was a drought year. We, I think we all heard about the deficit in rainfall. Um, generally that doesn't happen two years in a row. We did see it back in 2016, summer of 2016. So that was four years ago. I know people think, oh, you're, you're making the same statement every year. It has been four years since we've had a really dry summer. Um, it is reasonable to expect that the costs related to water are going to go up. Andover, we're currently, we can anticipate the Andover cost of water is going to go up 2.5% next year for us. Uh, we pay 95% of their tier one rate, but we're in a deal where they can't increase our rate by more than two and a half percent per year. Because of that, right now we're paying about 91% of their tier one rate. So even if they do no increase in Andover next year, we can anticipate a two and a half percent. We still wouldn't hit that 95% of their tier one rate at this point. Um, personnel costs due to contracts, indirect costs, that's the money the water department pays for the support that other departments give to us. Those go up historically year over year. Supplies such as pipe, copper, fire hydrants also go up. Um, so it, to project that there would be a, an increase on the order of about two and a half percent per year just takes into account those things. If we had large capital projects that hit, hit the, uh, the debt service, that can also impact the need for rate increases. So two and a half percent is not what we're saying we need to do each year for the next five years, but it, it's gonna be on a minimum probably of that magnitude. Um, show a graph here, which is, it actually come, we started showing this in 
2017 when we were talking about the difference between going to Andover versus going to MWRA. Um, and what it's showing, it's hard to read, but the, the vertical axis says costs in million gallons or million dollars per year. And you can see where we are right now. We're in FY21. Our budget is just about four and a half million dollars. So it's right on where this chart was. What the lines in these charts do, they just show the, uh, the increase in cost due to the cost to purchase water. Uh, we had projected Andover rate would go up for us for about two and a half percent per year. Uh, at the time we put these projections together, looking backwards, they had actually gone up about 1.2% per year over the last 15 years before. Uh, but we figured 2.5% was probably a reasonable expectation going forward, both from what we'd seen and from our discussions with them. That's the blue line on the chart. The red line is MWRA costs. And based on MWRA statements and their history, we expected that to go up about 4% per year. Um, so we are where we are. We didn't. We never said the rates were gonna. There would be no increase in expenses. This this chart is pretty much what we were saying. The increases would be over time. And there's there's been some question. Well, wouldn't we have been better to go to MWRA? And just the last slide I really want to show is a comparison. As I mentioned at the beginning, there were projections that we would need to go up about 40% in the MWRA costs over the first five years of the project. And you can see that that's the right hand side of this, this chart. If you go down to the fifth year, we're up at 42% over what we were. And then what have we actually done? We did an 866 the first three years, then decided let's hold off. Um, if we were to do a number like two and a half percent, which would basically wipe away the potential deficit this year, we would be at a cumulative rate increase of about 24%. So it, to me, this definitely tells us that we made the right decision, that the uh, Andover alternative was kind of uh, the, the wiser alternative um, to go with. And I guess I guess I would leave it there and open it up to discussions and or questions. Um, we did meet the, with the Water Commission last Thursday night. Um, and then, as I think in your packet was a recommendation from the Water Commission. Well, the Water Commission recommended 2.5% increase. Yes, that was the recommendation uh, by our, our board uh, vote the other night. Okay. Thanks, Mr. Gucci. Questions? Mr. O'Leary? Mr. O'Leary's doing calculations over there, trying to sort this out. You can no, see it. I don't it. have to do calculations. I've been working with them for so many years now. It's a matter of fact, I, I spent a considerable amount of time with them, Mr. Gilberto and, and uh, Mark, uh, over the last few days uh, since our last meeting, just going over, you know, what's happened with retained earnings and uh, getting a better understanding as to um, why we we're at we we're at. I think what's important for the the board to recognize is that those substantial increases that we uh, consciously made in 2015, 16, 17, because of we were anticipating going with MWRA, was intentional and deliberate because we were looking to build up the, the stabilization fund for rate stabilization purposes when we transferred over to the MWRA because the increases were gonna be significant. And we didn't want to uh, hit everybody with a 40% increase in one fell swoop and kind of ease people into it and then anticipate, you know, four or 5% increases per year if we went with MWRA. Well, again, long story short, we went with Andover and uh, the cost is significantly less. The cost is still there, and increases are gonna come annually, but we have been able to build up our stabilization fund, as Mark pointed out, to about $2.7 million, which is substantial and good. Now, the question is, do we need all that money right now in the stabilization fund? One thing that uh, we have to understand and recognize, remind ourselves, is that in the deal that we negotiated with Andover, uh, we get favorable rates based upon um, what they charge their residential rates there. So we get 95% of whatever their most favorable rate is, but they still see uh, rate increases every year, but at least we're paying the least amount per gallon of water than any other customer they have. Um, but that being said, we also are getting a credit from the town of Andover to the tune of 
for nine hundred and fifty thousand dollars over a ten year period. So almost you know eighty thousand dollars a year credit, which is going to disappear in year ten. So we're going to have to absorb that somehow or another, and we need to look at that going forward. And what are we in now? Year three, two or three. Um, so seven years out, that credit of eighty plus thousand dollars a year is going to disappear, and we have to absorb that. So how do we want to do it? And how are we going to approach it? And uh, so these are things that we have to consider. Yes, we have you know, $2.75 million sitting over here available for um, capital projects or rate stabilization, but we don't want to give a false impression um, that our rates are not going to go up because they are. You know, and to Mark's point, you know, two and a half percent is a reasonable um, expectation looking forward, particularly based upon what we're currently paying Andover, which is less than the 95% we negotiated. Uh, so they can go up two and a half percent on us a year maximum for the first 10 years. So that being said, we're not in a bad position. Uh, we have some money to, to stabilize the rates. It's just a question. Let's not lose sight that we're also going to have to absorb uh, that $80,000 a year plus in a short short period of time, plus the capital improvements we're going to be doing. So it seems to be, um, I, it was shocking if you recall, you know, that we had ended up with retained earnings of just $15,000 in the current fiscal year or the past fiscal year from a $450,000 retained earning and $500,000 a year before. So basically your retained earnings have dropped a million dollars in two years. You know, what happened? And again, the big thing was we were looking to ease ourselves into and over over a period of time, <laughs> two or three years. Um, we had a a situation where we had to shut down our wells and as Mark said, go to cold turkey to Andover, which substantially increased our costs, which again, eats into the retained earnings. There's no doubt, we're not selling money at a loss. You know, we sell water to our consumers here. We, we're not doing it at a loss, but we're just not making as much on it now because we're not producing it. And we're buying from Andover and those costs are escalating and we're selling, we're buying more and selling more. So the Delta is diminishing and uh, we need to catch up with that. So I feel comfortable in relation to the explanation as to why the retained earnings have dropped substantially over the last two years. And I also am um, cognizant of the fact that it wouldn't be um, realistic to have a zero rate increase because it's just gonna come catch up with us down the road, you know, in very short period of time. So I think what we need to do is be honest with our rate payers here and, um, Tell them that you know, we can anticipate a 2.5% increase going forward. Uh, it's reasonable. It's um, easily explained in relation to the cost. And again, the variables in relation to drought situations and how much we sell and how much we buy is, again, dependent upon the weather. So again, I appreciate uh, Mark and town administrators spending the time with me uh, over the last couple of weeks. And um, I personally am, am comfortable with what's being proposed. Thank you, Mr. O'Leary. Anybody have questions? All set with the members. Is there anyone attending that has any questions? <laughs> I don't see any questions. Okay. So this is uh, before, excuse me, I'm sorry. Thank you. Someone, Mr. Walner. Just, I was just gonna make a comment. I, you know, I, I have 100% faith in the group that is leading this effort. And uh, um, we should all as a town be very happy that previous efforts by previous boards really stuck to making the switch from MWRA to Andover. And we're reaping the rewards of that. So the increase we're, facing is totally modest compared to what it could have been and for many, many decades to go. So I, I just think it's a fantastic job. You know, Mr. O'Leary, I know worked on that. The late Bob Masseri worked on that. Um, it was their diligence that helped make that happen and previous boards stuck to their guns and made it happen. So as a town, you know, we should all applaud all the good work that's been done here. Um, and I stand behind whatever recommendation they make. 
Thank you. Anything further from anyone? Mr. Gilbert, this is on for our recommendation on the water rate. Uh, so the vote would be to uh, establish the water rate. That that authority lies with the select board. Um, okay. You have to so, recommend to the water commission. I'm sorry to interrupt you. I apologize. Sure. Okay. So we're. Do I have a? If there's no further discussion, and I see no other. I don't see any other questions or participation. Is there a motion, Mr. Student? Yes. Madam Chair, I move to I move to approve a two and a half increase per, percent increase in water use rates and to retain charges and fees at their current rates. Second. I have a motion by Mr. Studo, a second by Mr. O'Leary. O'Leary, any further discussion? Madam Chair. Yes. To, I, I realize the motion does not reflect this, but that would be for um, the period beginning January first, twenty twenty one. To be clear, there will not be any retroactive change in billing. Thank you. Do you, do you, do you want that to be incorporated into the motion? If it could be corrected, that would be great. Yes, thank you. Madam Chair, I move to approve a 2.5% increase beginning January 1st, 2021 in water use rates and to retain charges and fees at their current rates. I'll second that again. <laughs> okay. Mr. Clark has stand up. So just in full transparency, I want everyone to understand the last time we read meters was November 1st. The next time we'll read meters is February 1st. So effectively, any bill we issue after January 1st is what the new rates will be charged at. It, okay. it's, it's impossible you know, not to include that two-month period from November 1st to January 1st. I know this gets confusing and it comes up every time we we increase, typically we increase the rates July 1st. What it does is it effectively captures from the last time we build, which typically is May 1st. So I wanna make sure everybody's clear on that and I'm not back billing people incorrectly. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm gonna amend the motion again. No, you already, that's, you already said that, said it the right way. You already said it the right way and it was seconded. Mr. Clark is correcting a comment I made about it being retroactive. And so when I said that, I meant billing, not water use. So thank you for clarifying, Clark. So we're all right with the January 1st date, not from the previous reading? We could say that any bill issued after January 1st, 2021, if we wanted to be crystal okay. clear. So you are going to amend it as okay. amended. That's Three times a charge, Madam Chair. I move to approve a two and a half increase, increase. beginning with the billing date of February 1st, and beginning with a reading period of November 1st, 2020, in water use rates and to retain charges and fees at their current rates. Second. <laughs> Mr. Clark, does that work for you? That'll work for me, yeah, I can do that. <laughs> so, I, so I have a motion by Mr. Sudo and a second, this time by Mr. Um, I beat Mr. O'Leary to it. And did any further discussion from my colleagues? There's an echo. Uh, there's a terrible echo. Madam Chair, shall I mute all? Oh. Sure. And if, sure. And if, so my colleagues, if you want, just put your hand and unmute yourself. Okay, I've muted everybody. Thank you. Okay. If there's no further discussion from my colleagues, I ju would just like to say from the chair that it it may seem as though we are, you know, indiscriminately increasing water rates, and I think we probably it probably would have been a wise course to have a, have this even in a smaller smaller incremental increases. I think we were obviously um, thrilled with the work that was done and understood by connecting with Andover what a significant benefit that was for us as a town financially 
but as was explained, I we certainly didn't anticipate having to go, you know, um, by all the water all of a sudden, like Mr. Clark explained. But I also think it's good for us to be, you know, steadily looking at this annually rather than 2.5 could have been 0.5 or, you know, 1.5 versus 2.5, especially right now where people are in difficult economic circumstance while it may seem like it was an easy decision to come to it's a it's a group a whole team of people looking at this trying to sort it through trying to figure out what's the best for the town and some of these these decisions that we have to make are inevitable even in these difficult financial times for people so um well i think it's well i think mr clark's suggestion to go to those other two available sources are they're great thinking outside of what we know is the inevitability of a rate increase i also think that we should keep those in place for the things that we know we're going to need to spend them on and uh, just kind of move forward with a consistent uh, review of this annually to see do we need to increase it at 0.5 one point you know now we're at 2.5 when perhaps we could have we could have um, kept it on a track so that we weren't facing this. Although some of it, like Mr. Clark said, was unpredictable. So that being said, anybody else? Mr. O'Leary, go ahead. You unmuted yourself. I have unmuted myself. Yeah, it, just, just again, that $2.7 million we have, again, we should be looking at that as um, – Again, it was for rate stabilization in the case of the MWRA, which isn't going to be needed. You know, we need to have some sort of dollar amount there. I don't think it needs to be that dollar amount. Um, so I think there's going to be a lot of discussion moving forward as to, you know, what should those retained earnings and the reserve funds be at. Um, and once that's determined, then we can use those monies for one-time expenditures so we don't have to bond um, and then have a true rate moving forward rather than a a masked rate, which will then catch up with us, you know, in year 12, 14, or whatever it's going to be. So again, uh, it's a good thing we had the money. It's a good thing it's there. It was a wise move on our part and the previous board's parts uh, the last several years to do that. Uh, so we're in a pretty good position. So, but again, I think we need to look at what the number should be and then determine how we're going to spend it on capital projects. Right, and we making sure we're forecasting like this, you know, like Mr. Clark did for us and like the team did for us, making sure we're on top of that forecasting. And we did we did know in that agreement and I do recall it was it was gonna be up to the two point five percent anyway. So that was something that was part of that that uh contract. So we did know that all automatically. So that was gonna happen if they increase their rate. So, all right, so that if there's no further discussion here, we have a motion and a second. Mr. O'Leary. Aye. Mr. Walner. Aye. Mrs. Gonzalez. Aye. Mr. Studo. Aye. Okay, so, and they tell me that. I think it's coming from you, Mrs. Gonzalez. <laughs> the echo. <laughs> there we go. So thank you to uh, uh, the team that is here that sat through and had you for us and gave us the explanation, and we'll be seeing you again soon. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. For, um, the next order of business is a, wa a wastewater update. Oh, yeah, we're going to see right now, actually. So, um, Mr. Gilberto, and Mr. You, Depp, um, sticking with us, and Mr. Clark, sticking with us. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so, we similarly have a PowerPoint presentation that was placed in your meeting packet for this evening's meeting relative to water infrastructure. And mm -hmm. I do believe that um, we have representatives of Wright Pierce. On with us still, Mike Stein, are, are you uh, on there still? Yes, uh, this is Mike Stein. And I, I know the hour is late, so thank you very much for uh, for sticking with us. Um, 
you know, you, we appreciate the effort you've put into this uh, update with regard to wastewater. Um, I'd be happy to operate the screen if perhaps you could take us through it. Okay. Um, so you'll share your screen. I will share my screen if that if that's easier for you. If you would rather share share yours, that's fine too. Nope, uh, that's fine. Okay, can everyone see that? Uh, okay. So my name is Mike Stein. I'm with Wright Pierce uh, Engineers, and this is the progress update for the wastewater uh, alternative projects. The overview of this presentation, I'll talk briefly about the study area, then I'll talk about in-town feasibility, and then I'll talk about the out-of-town conveyance and improvements evaluation. This map here d depicts the potential sewer areas. Uh, you can see, uh, first of all, north is to the right of the page, to the right of the screen. So you can see the this includes Main Street, down to Park Street, over to Concord Street, um, the residential areas west of Main Street, uh, North Street going out to Lowell Street area, and also around Martin's Pond. So for a project of this size to be, size, to be uh, viable, there needs to be an initial revenue stream. So the sewer area was re refined uh, to maximize the revenue stream uh, to concentrate in the business commercial areas on Main Street, Concord Street to support business development, and then going out North Street uh, to pick up Lowell Street where there is a high concentration of residential users. Next slide. Okay, as I said, the area was re refined uh, to mainly concentrate in the business commercial areas and in areas to support business development. This study included to identify the needed infrastructure. We obviously know that uh, we need gravity sewer pipe, but also uh, we're going to need uh, several pump stations and, and force mains. And then lastly, there of course, there's got to be a financial aspect. How much will it cost? What What are the costs? We also okay. considered uh, should the project be phased phased in to lessen the bite of the cost and to spread it out over a period of time, or just doing do it in in one shot. And then how to pay for it? How is this project going to be paid for? The entire community will, will share the cost up front, and as users are connected to the, to the sewer system, the community share of the cost will diminish over time. And then lastly, to complete the financial this financial exercise, we need to understand what the out-of-town costs will be to transport the wastewater generated in North Reading to the Greater Lawrence Sanitary District. So this leads us into the next slide and what are out-of-town improvements. So this is a map of, of North Reading, uh, excuse me, a map of Andover. And all the wastewater generated in Andover goes to a pump station called the Shawsheen Village Pump Station. And that gets pumped to an interceptor which flows to the Greater Lawrence Sanitary District uh, for treatment. So you can see on the far right hand side of that map there's a green square right at the edge of the map and that is GLSD, Greater Lawrence Sanitary District. So you'll see four connections on this map. Connection one is, is, is the orange line um, and that is obviously the longest. Connection two is, is, is the yellow line. Um, going up Main Street from uh, from North Reading. 
Uh, connection th three is the green line, which um, is going up the uh, Route 125 bypass towards North Andover. And then connection four is the blue line, and that also goes up 125 uh, to 114. And that bypasses the uh, Andover collection system and goes directly to the interceptor on the other side of uh, 495 in back of the movie theaters. So moving on to slide seven, or the next slide. So of these four connections, you'll see that that uh, connection two is, is the shortest. Uh, so they range in length from from just a little bit over five and a half miles to just about nine miles. And the total project costs range anywhere on the low end from 21 million to the high end of 46 million. And the construction cost per linear foot, you'll see in the far right hand column, ranges anywhere from $450 per linear foot to $750. Uh, next slide. So with these four connections, we need to keep in mind that no matter what connection is ultimately um, selected, um, all of them will involve coordination with the mass DOT since some portion of the project be, will be within a state right away. Connection one is the longest and that will require upgrades to the existing sewer system in Andover that North Reading will have to participate in cost sharing. And also North Reading will be subject to user fees, um, O&M operation maintenance fees for the use of the Andover's wastewater infrastructure. Similar to uh, connection one is, is connection two, although connection two is the, the shortest route, which goes up Main Street. Um, but because of the continuing street reconstruction projects in the downtown area due to the gas main replacement and the town piggy, piggyback on water main replacement, this, con this connection is pretty much off the table for the uh, time being. So because connection two uh, appears to be pretty much off the table, we started to look at connection three and four, which more or less um, skirts around the uh, downtown area similar to, to connection one. Um, so connection three, as you saw on the map previously, goes up 125 there to route 114 and back in the Andover down Haverhill Street where it eventually connects up to the uh, pump station which pumps to GLSD. But connection four, um, goes up 125 to 114, as I explained before, and connects up to the interceptor to GLSD behind the uh, movie theaters on the other side of 145. But this connection, connection four, this is this is a, an option looking out 10 years, um, if, if not beyond, since Route 114 has had several resurfacing projects completed and they are scheduled for more. Plus the fact uh, there is a reconstruction project which is slated for 114, which is to begin in early 2023. Uh, next slide. So as far as preliminary costs uh, and, and schedule, and, and, and these costs include, you know, all, all in-town costs, uh, all the out-of-town improvements needed. Uh, there's an inflow reduction fee and, and there's actual connection fee to the GLSD. Back in 2018, of April 2018, 
it was stated as is 135 million to 204 million since April 2018. We've we've done more work and able to refine that cost um, a little bit better. Right now, it's looking at we're between 100 million to 125 million. And lastly, everyone asks, uh, what is the schedule uh, for for this project? And that. That's a great question, but but what, what we can tell you, if in in a perfect world, if the, if there is such a thing, uh, if all the stars are lined up in that, uh, we're probably looking between six to eight years, if not a tad longer, maybe even ten years, uh, for uh, project completion, for when um, a droplet of wastewater that's generated in North Reading will end up for treatment at the Greater Lawrence Sanitary District. And with that, that's that was a very brief uh, progress update on the wastewater projects. Okay, thank you. Questions, um, Mr. O'Leary. Uh, just comments. Uh, I think it's important for the board to recognize that if you go back to the other map, Michael Gilberto, on the different four different routes, the original route that we were talking about with Andover is the orange route, which is actually one of the longest routes, uh, which goes up uh, just over the line in Andover, up Rattlesnake Hill Road, and then all up through Ballard Vale, and then connects down behind the center of, um, goes around the center of Andover and connects to the Shaw Sheen area. Uh, that was the first route that we had contemplated and talked with with Andover. The the Main Street route um, was obviously the most direct route that we would consider, you know, and like like to have considered. Um, and then um, you know but didn't turn out to be say the most palatable, you know, for the town of Andover in and this whole the situation with the gas pipeline explosion and the uh, reconstruction of Route 28 in the downtown area there um, creates some more problems for us um, in relation to that. And I think, Mike uh, Stein, you can back me up here. When we talk about uh, uh, state highways, you know, reconstruction, major reconstruction, they generally don't like to reopen the roads um, for about a 10-year period once they dig them all up. So That is correct. So we've got that problem in the Andover Center area, and then we have the problem on Route 114, and which would be uh, option number four, uh, basically in front of Merrimack College. If you go up 125 and you take a left on 114, in front of Merrimack College, all the way down to the Market Basket Plaza, past there to 495, is where we would tie in uh, with the interceptor to go to Greater Lawrence Sewer. Um, again, it's a it's a good option to be considering. However, they're in the midst of 25% right now of the planning stages for reconstruction on Route 114. And again, that option of going down 114 in front of uh, uh, Merrimack College may not be available to us for, for a decade. But again, depending upon how the timelines go and how far we progress and whether we get the support of the community to, to move forward, uh, it's certainly gonna drive the timeline. So again, um, Andover has been cooperative in working with us um, of late in relation to you know which options. They haven't ruled out any options in assisting us, uh, but again, uh, it's important for us to, to recognize these are the, the options that we may have available to us. And then we wanna look at, you know, what are the uh, operating and maintenance costs moving forward? And do we wanna be tied to their infrastructure and their plans? Or do we wanna go our own Route 125? and basically be the owner of all the, the property there which would be good so again uh, we're not looking for any um decision by the board because again this is very preliminary as to but uh, i thought it was important to give the board and the community an update as to you know what are we looking at what are we considering uh, what do we anticipate the cost to be based upon the latest information that we have and uh, what's a realistic timeline as far as an expectation and again, in the perfect world, you were just given that uh, that timeline. But uh, but there's still a lot more work to do, a lot more conversations to have uh, with the state, the town of North Andover, town of Andover, and again, internally here as to uh, what we think we can afford and when we can afford it. 
Okay, thanks, Mr. O'Leary. Mr. Waller? Yeah, so um, what I saw for a price range was 100 to 125 million. I think that's what I saw on that slide. And so I guess um, at some point, I think it's next, yeah, it's right there. So the 100 to 125 million, I guess, um, I don't know if it's too early to even ask the question, but, it, and I don't, I have absolutely no idea what the numbers are, but if we were to look at a similar town that had a single, uh, similar profile as us, and they already had existing sewer in there, like, does the tax rate, does the tax, does, does the uh, fees coming from the owners of, on the pipes, in effect, pay for it? I mean, will it be able to afford it? And I don't even know how to, I'm not framing the question right, but basically what's the ROI and is it realistic for our town based on the, um, on the path you've laid out, the, the, the lesser path, is it realistic for our town to imagine we're going to be able to actually uh, pay for that if everybody hooks up? And that's not a question I expect tonight. I'm just wondering if that can be something that can be provided to us some point in the future so we get a ballpark um, or when that might be available if it's even even available at this point? Yes, uh, that's a great question. And and that is part of the uh, the uh, work that we, we are doing um, is is how to make this affordable or can it e even be affordable? And so just something in the future you're going to you're going to be looking at? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, add, yes. Yeah, it is. It is going to be something that will be covered in um, in the first phase study. Okay. Madam Chair. Yes, Mr. Gilberto. So I, I'm sorry if I'm making folks dizzy by <laughs> searching on my computer while we're live here. But I don't know who is doing that. All right. That's you controlling that. Um, so we, um, I have up on my screen here that this is an executive summary of a report that was done for the town. I think seven or eight years ago um, by FX, FXM Associates, which did conduct the type of analysis that uh, you're referring to, Mr. Walner. Uh, part of the, the charge for the ongoing planning effort with Wright Pierce is to try to build off of this. Um, I, I don't want to say update it because they're not going to do the in-depth parcel by parcel work, but I think that the thinking is that there are some, there's information in this study that if we were to um, build off of it, we could get a better understanding of where there may be some value um, and what the value amounts would be for the investment. And that's obviously designed to put us in a position financially to advance the project. So yes, there will be more to come with regard to the financial component of this. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, if we're, if we're in the, you know, I mean, if we're benchmark wise comparable to other communities with, that have already gone through this, you know, then great. But if we're really just outside of reality, <laughs> I guess we should know that sooner than later, um, if we can even nail it down. I, I'm familiar with the study, and I don't remember it being very impressive. But I, you know, I don't. I, it's a very complicated issue, so I don't even want to draw any conclusions based on this study. Um, it's really new numbers and a, a new way of looking at things. So um, I appreciate. I would appreciate in the future when we have the time to know more about that, as I think everybody would want to know. Absolutely. Thanks, Mr. Walner. Mrs. Gonzalez? I think you might be muted. You're muted. Any questions? No, I'm good. Thank you. Mr. Studo? I'm all set. Thank you. Okay. Um, Mr. Stein, I do have a couple of questions. Yes. If you go back to that map of, um, sorry, Mrs. <laughs> Mrs. Gonzalez, can you mute your, can you mute? You're muted, yeah, okay. Yeah. If you can go back to that map with all the different colored lines, the different pathways, the four pathways. Yes, uh, and now I, I know nothing about sewer infrastructure, certainly haven't given it the investment of time that Mr. Gilberto and Mr. O'Leary and Mr. Studo have been given this, but if we're talking about the reduced, reduced plan to put sewer through 
Main Street and Concord Street. And let's say we go with connection number four. How how are businesses along Main Street going to tie into that all the way, you know, along a completely different pathway? I don't understand what what I'm looking at here. So if you could explain it to me, like sewer infrastructure 101, that would, I think, help me understand why that's a feasible pathway to getting the businesses and residences along 28 connected through, let's say, connection three or connection four, or even right. connection one for that matter. Okay. Yep. And absolutely. Is that, do, you, am I, do you understand what I'm asking you? Um, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna try to answer it, and um, and I and I think I know exactly what uh, you want. So, so what what you're looking at uh, in this map is just the sewer infrastructure within the town of Andover to get the wastewater generated in North Reading to the Greater Lawrence Sanitary District. Okay, I so, see. So in North Reading itself, um, there will, for example, on Main Street, there will be a, a sewer system. Uh, there'll be a pipe with a combination of a couple pump stations and enforced mains. Um, that, the right that, way you are directing it is going to come right through 28 and up through Concord. Correct. So does the cost that you're quoting for this include that infrastructure or just the infrastructure on one of these four pathways with well, those the so if you uh, go to your next slide the next slide that you added the estimates right so so the cost uh, from a hundred million to 125 million includes all the sewer infrastructure within the town of North Reading and the sewer oh. improvements in Andover to get the wastewater to Greater Lawrence Sanitary District. Okay, so in, that's including both. And those connections that you're showing, those four pathways, those are existing. So does the cost also, was, does the cost require us to expand what's existing? And does that require more permitting that than what we were currently seeking or possible you know we've talking about seeking for this particular infrastructure actually um i'll i'll backtrack here for a bit um when it comes to utilizing the most available infrastructure you're looking at connection one okay um, connection two is a force main um, going up Route 28, uh, uh, Main Main Street into Andover about halfway, and then connecting up to the Andover existing uh, collection system. Um, connection three and connection four, for example, connection four is all brand new pipe. We're not utilizing any existing infrastructure just because there there isn't any for for that for, for that connection four route. Um, but for connection three, it's it's very similar. It's mostly all new construction until we get to Haverhill Street in Andover, where we connect up to existing sewer infrastructure within Andover. So for all of these pathways, the first, it looks like connection one is, it looks like, you, you know, you said connection two is all but rejected, right? So you're focusing on three and four? Uh, nope. Um, one, uh, connection one is still a viable option. Um, con connection three is still a viable option. Connection four um, just due to the um, the mass DOT work out there on 114 uh, in the moratoriums that they have, you know, that you can't excavate for 
for such a long period of time after projects are done, uh, that pretty much rules out uh, connection number four. Okay. Okay, so then, so three and four don't exist, we would put them in. So my last question to you is, where those are, which if four is ruled out, we're pretty much looking at three, sounds like one or three. Does, does it looks like three and four are going into the two other communities versus just staying all straight through Andover. So do we have to do additional permitting requirements or permissions or other things getting those two communities to agree? I know we already have to get the approval to go through the Greater Lawrence Sewer District, but does that involve additional permitting and is that also incorporated into your estimates? Uh, it, it involves, uh, involve it, it we, we don't have to involve additional entities just because we are within a state right away. So it's all coordination and permitting with the mass DOT. Okay. Even though, even though we are going through North Reading, uh, I mean, we've already talked with, with uh, North Reading um, and, and they have e even said that, you know, look, it's, as a town, as a town, excuse me, the town of North Andover, um, that you know we have no jurisdiction in that road. It's strictly Mass DOT, um, so so that's that's who we have to coordinate with, and and for connection three or four, we'll be coordinating with the Mass DOT anyway, just going up uh, Route 125 uh, from the North Reading Andover town line. Okay. Thank you. All right. Any th they really appreciate this. This is so so helpful, I think, to at least given us an understanding of what was explained the other day and what you're looking at and what you're trying to work on, knowing this is a preliminary review. Excellent. So if there's no there aren't any other questions. Anybody else have you? <laughs> I see the chair, the school committee chair over there. So I, you came on, you, your picture came on, so I figured you might have questions. So please, <laughs> Chairman Buckley, welcome. I almost made it through a meeting without saying anything, but <laughs> I can't do that. That's I, I becoming have, a pattern, Mr. Studo. <laughs> I just, I just had, almost to a habit. I, I just had one question, and the, the estimate, went from 135 to 204 million two years ago to when it was tightened a little bit down to 100 to 125. And it seems like a pretty significant reduction, especially on the high end of that. And I'm just wondering what caused it to drop so, so substantially. And I just want to make sure that it, that it is all inclusive and that we're not just saying you need to fit within this budget and then Later on, we're going to be dealing with it over what we were expecting. Um, great question. From from April 2018 to to today, uh, we've learned a lot more uh, about uh, what what we're going to be doing in North Reading, or what our options about are available that we're going to be doing in North Reading, and we learn a lot more about the infrastructure um with, within within the town of andover as well and let me let me add as well so the first estimates were done um they were this is rob williamson speaking from right pierce too i work with mike on this um the first estimates were based on that the orange route on the map which was the the longest route and that route was developed for lack of a better term in complete isolation without any input from andover whatsoever um it was it was uh this was all planned out during the the um deir phase and we were unable to engage them at the time so it was based on um some limited information that they were able to provide us um but they didn't want to really get too engaged in the process because they weren't quite sure what it was where it was going to go 
So those numbers were at the time, those very first numbers generated were quite conservative, not knowing um, very much at all about Andover's system. And then as um, the negotiations with Andover um, advanced um, and we were able, able to get more refinement of what their system consisted of and develop these other three routes, that's what really led to um, us being able to refine the numbers and such, um, and then as, as such the significant drops in the cost. And Steve wants to add to this as well. Yeah, I, I think it's important to, Michael uh, Gilbert, if you could scroll back down to the North Reading original map, the other way. I yeah, because uh, you changed the scope. The scope changed. What, what changed the scope was when we were originally talking about, we were talking about Martin's Pond area, and then um, Burdett Road, Ames Street area connecting in too. And we we're also looking at the financial aspect in relation to the cost of putting in that infrastructure and the return on that investment with the users helping it pay for it. Well, a single family house user is very different than a, an apartment building or a condo complex or, or an industrial complex. So that's why we scaled back the scope of the infrastructure development in North Reading, which also significantly reduced the cost. Because if you go to the next slide, all we're looking at now primarily is just Main Street, North Street, Park and Concord Street, because that will give us the most bang for our buck. And again, everything that's being proposed to be built here will allow for an expansion of the sewer system into these other areas at a later date, once the finances it starts to generate enough income to support itself, rather than the taxpayers doing it all at once and carrying the whole cost. So between that and then as uh, Rob and Mike pointed out, you know, our best of back of the envelope guess up in Andover was around $26 million with limited information uh, from Andover. And again, we've been able to refine those figures a little bit more. So that those costs have gone up a bit and our infrastructure costs and uh, threading based upon, you know, what we're proposing here is significantly less as far as infrastructure. So that's why, that's why you see the big drop from 204 down to 125 million. Correct me if I'm wrong, Rob. Yep, nope. Perfect. Thank you, guys. Just yeah, just one additional you. question. Are, are we going to, um, I remember from before we had, I had heard that if we started doing this project that the state DEP might force us to do something around the Martins Pond area simply because we're going to be there. Are we still seeing that as a risk or is that just something that we really can put off to a phase two or phase three? No, not at all. Their, their attitude and uh, appetite for seeing uh, promoting economic development uh, outweighs the necessity from what they used to be telling us for decades now is that you know we had to, from a public health standpoint, address the Martins Pond area first in order to make it work, and that made it economically unfeasible. That's why we were never able to move forward, you know, in past decades. So the change in attitude. Uh, from the state standpoint, I think they'd rather see you do some infrastructure now with the ability to expand into those areas and address them later on. But there hasn't been any discussion with them uh, where there's been a, a catch you know, a caveat that we had to do that at any specific timeline or date, which is a good thing. It's a, it's a significant time. change. Yep. But there would still be the potential down the line, like you said. Yeah, and again, all the so infrastructure. The way this, this, with the way this is mar marked, I think is. And again, all the pump stations along the way would also take an additional infrastructure being built out and get it up to the Greater Lawrence. Okay, that's so great. That's right. Yeah, <laughs> that's incorporated in right now into the into those estimates, so. All that's factored in as best as can be factored into an estimate. Correct. So we're definitely going to need some help. We're going to need help paying for this. So um, that is, um, I think, is there anyone else that has any questions? That's great. A, a picture is worth a thousand words. That, that helps explain it in a way that I couldn't comprehend when we were just talking about it. So thank you for the presentation. Okay, any, any other comment, question? We're all set. Thank you for your 
help and stick sticking with us for this late. It's almost no 11. Problem. Appreciate no it. Yep. Thanks for having Thank us. you. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to uh, recuse myself from the next order of business and ask the vice chair to take over the meeting because I there I have a family member that works at the that establishment. So take it away, Mrs. Gonzalez. So uh, is my voice okay? Were you guys getting feedback from me? Still a little, but nothing. Not as bad. Not as bad. Okay. When you talk. All right. Um, so we have um, an application for amendment, um, change of doing business. Do we have James Dietz? Is he here? Yep. I'm right here. So the licensee is report requesting to change the do doing business as name the application Correct. as well as a recent media release are enclosed we've got so go ahead uh, uh you talking to me, talking to me. yeah Sorry. is this yeah this is jim beats yes. yes yes so we are uh applying for a uh, dba name change from Dos Lobos to Apothecary Ales, Brewery, and Pitchy. We are applying for a brewer's license. Um, and that process entails us to first apply for a federal stamp or a tax stamp. So uh, in the process, there's about 12 steps to apply for this, uh, put a brewery together. And the first step is to apply for a, a TTP, which stands for Tax Trade Bureau uh, Licensing from the federal government. Then the next step from that would be to apply to the ABCC, the state of Massachusetts, for a pub brewer's license. So um, we're looking, the application for the federal stamp um, requires us to change uh, DBA. Any questions? Any questions? Are there any questions? Madam Chair. Madam Chair. I should say Madam Vice Chair, excuse me. <laughs> uh, Mr. Dietz, thank you. Um, so, uh, thank you. Ms. Gonzalez mentioned that there is a, a media release a media that release. we had um, um, Come across and some of us had seen here in town so i provided it to the board and it does speak to the future um, for the uh the establishment um the the uh, incorporation of the brewery um and so I, I right now what you've come before us with uh, an application that uh, i would guess I classify as a straightforward change as doing business as at yes. this stage uh, is there any anticipated change with regard to the interest in the license or otherwise when the merger is completed so the uh the corporation stays the same. It's Dos Lobos LLC. We're, we're taking on partners to that corporation. And the uh, partners are all on the federal tax stamp application. Um, and we will be uh, uh, just submitting that to federal application. And that's the next step for us in the process. Do you anticipate um, assuming approval at the federal level coming back with a change of beneficial interest in uh, Dos Lobos LLC? So um, myself and uh, Jim Dietz Jr. also are going to have 50% ownership and we have 50% ownership going to the uh, new partners coming in. And that that's an application we should expect to see at some point when the permitting requires it? Correct. Okay, so do you have a timeline for that at this point, Mr. Dietz? Um, so we have a site plan review um, slated for the January Water Selections meeting, and that will give us our permitting, and that'll give us our our um, uh, site plan review. Um, and at that point, um, 
we're not changing the corporation or bringing the partners on until we start the construction. And as soon as we start construction, that's when we bring the partners on. So everything is preliminary until that point. Okay, and Mr. Dietz, you mentioned site plan review. Is that with the, the planning commission? You had said select board, but I think it's the planning uh, commission. Yes, the planning commission, I'm sorry. Okay, so is it a site plan review is for the property itself and the work you wish to do there? That's correct. Okay, great. That answers my questions, Madam Chair, Madam Vice Chair. Anybody else have questions? Mr. O'Leary? No? I don't have any questions, just comments. I think it's an interesting concept and uh, it, uh, interesting times. Taking the risk associated with the changing what the venue is going to be. And I look forward to uh, seeing what the site plan, plan review brings us and what you're looking to do going forward. So I, I assume that you'll be back before the board at some point. And yes, we will. Uh, I look forward to uh, support your efforts. So. Field. Great. Thanks, Mr. Larry. Anyone else? I'd like to, to add, it also sounds very exciting. It sounds like a, it'll be a great addition to town. Um, are, is this, does this have to do with um, the Wilmington Brewery? That uh, uh, there is no brewery in place in this project. Um, you know, there's, there's a home brewery that we're partnering up with, and they they are based in Wilmington, but there's no brewery out there. Not, there's no functioning brewery now. There's a there's basically a test kitchen done. Um, um, it, we get a rest. That's where we're getting our recipes. Okay. So we've been brewing for a number of years, establishing recipes. And now we got to extrapolate them out to bigger sizes, and that's in the process of doing now. There's actually an engineer. I'm learning so much about this. There's actually an engineer that actually extrapolates those recipes from a 15 gallon to a 200 gallon because it's not one for one all the time. Great. You might get some volunteers to be a critic here, you know. Yeah. If you're yeah. some <laughs> <laughs> so, are we? Uh, it's it's we very exciting for us, though. We're very. Uh, we're very we're very excited about it. Um, our partners are uh, tremendous growers and tremendous business people and members of the community. And uh, we're very excited. Uh, Steve is actually here. Uh, if you want to say hello, Steve, uh, one of our partners. Yeah. Hi, everyone. I'm a North Reading native. My parents uh, still live in town. I live five minutes over the border in North uh, Wilmington. Um, I'm a pharmacist at Brigham Women's Hospital in Boston, but have a, a, a penchant for craft beer. And uh, I built a home brewery within the limits of uh, federal and state regulations on, on home brewing. And uh, we pitched an idea to the Deets uh, in September of 2019, and it's gotten far enough now where we're applying for federal license. And uh, that's what this uh, visit with you guys uh, is, is to, to change the DBA so that we can apply for our federal license as we move forward. All right, it's very exciting. <clears throat> do we have a motion? Yes, we do. Madam Vice Chair, I move to approve a change of DBA for Dos Lobos LLC from Dos to Hypothecacy Sales Brewery and Kitchen. Second. Can you say that again? Apothecary. Apothecary, yep. It's hard for everybody to say. <laughs> All right, I have a motion and I have a second from Mr. O'Leary. Any discussion? Mr. O'Leary? Aye. Aye. Mr. Walner? Sorry. Aye. Aye. Mr. Studo? Aye. Aye. And Gonzalez is aye. Mrs. Bagapelli is abstaining. Mrs. Bagapelli is abstained. Somebody watch this one? Best of luck to you. Thank you. I thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for hanging in there. Yes, thank you. Thank you.
And I will turn it back over to Mrs. Manupelli. Thank you, Mrs. Gonzalez. Okay, the next order of business is accept a donation for the fire department. Mr. Gilberto. Madam Chair, thank you. Um, you have a, in your packet a memorandum from Fire Chief Don Stats with regard to this donation, which is being um, offered in the amount of $1,000 by um, Art Grossman, a resident of town. Um, he wished to make a donation to the fire department, contacted the chief several times. As the chief states, he attempted to dissuade Mr. Grossman, but Mr. Grossman was insistent, and we greatly appreciate his commitment to the department and his willingness to make a contribution. Um, we, um, we're happy to recommend to you that the board accept this donation that would go into a gift account for the fire department to be used uh, for a need to be identified in the future. Um, and we again greatly appreciate Mr. Grossman um, stepping forward and making this um, contribution. Um, Mr. Grossman spoke of an incident that happened at the library going back a year or so in which he witnessed um, the response of the fire department and um, how it um, certainly made a, an impression on him um, in, in what he, um, you know, what, what occurred and um, expressed, his, expressed his gratitude and um, we thank him for uh, for the donation. Uh, we took a, we were able, to, unfortunately, we, because of the social distancing requirements, we had a, a very small um, phot photographic opportunity a couple of weeks ago where we were able to take a picture with Mr. Grossman, uh, socially distanced, of course. Um, for folks, we appreciate that opportunity as well. Um, and we recommend the board vote to accept the donation. Thank you, that's wonderful. This is, this is some good stuff, so. I uh, do we have a motion first of all I'm chair I move to accept the donation from Arthur Grossman for the North Running Fire Department do second. I have a second, second. motion by Mr. Studo and a second by Mr. O'Leary any further discussion Mr. O'Leary aye Mr. Walner Mr. Studo aye Mrs. Gonzalez. Aye. And Manu Pelli is aye. And uh, any comments? Comments from the members? Thank you. <laughs> Thank no, you. We appreciate it very much. And, it, you know, again, people have a great appreciation for the fire department, but uh, when they step forward and make a donation in order to assist in the purchasing of equipment and things, it's even, even a greater recognition an acknowledgement that is greatly appreciated. Definitely, especially even right now in these times when yeah. people are, it's wonderful for someone to be, to step forward and do this. So thank you for the donation. Okay, next order of business, um, license renewals. Uh, and uh, I think I'm recusing myself for this one too, if we're doing them. I think I have to recuse uh, from this one. So, Madam. Not all of them. Just all of them, okay, um, Madam Chair, or just. Uh, Madam Chair, through you to the board members. Um, so we had indicated we were placing. I, I, I thought they were all together, Mr. Gilberto. I didn't okay. see a motion in there, but I thought that they were going to be approved all together. I wish that we could, Madam Chair, because it would certainly streamline the discussion. <laughs> um, th there are several motions that were added during the day today. Uh, it's a motion okay. that in the folder for the meeting, separate from the main meeting packet. Um, fortunately, um, Jane and Karen were able to get them into a single document. So there is one entitled um, licenses and there's a second one of entitled appointments. But there are multiple motions within those um those two documents. So, in terms I have of the vote. Vote. you have the vote. Thank you. Okay. So, start? I don't, I don't see those in the packet, but I'm gonna. I, I would have to recuse myself um, from Dos Dos Lobos and Heavenly Donuts. Dos Lobos and Heavenly Donuts. I have a Neither. motivated child. <laughs> I think you're good. You're good for tonight. Yeah, okay. you're good. Neither right. of them are on it. Okay, thank you. I'm sorry. I got a little confused. 
because I, I I thought that we were doing these all together. So, all right. We can't. We have to take them one by one. Is that what you're telling me? Unfortunately. <laughs> this should be <laughs> its own meeting night. All right. Mr. Studo, do we have a we have several motions. Yes. Madam Chair, I move to renew the following common and particular licenses to expire December 31st, 2021, subject to all regulatory department requirements for Andrew's House of Pizza, Dunkin' Donuts, Holy Donuts, McDonald's Restaurant, Starbucks Coffee, The Hornet's Nest. Second. I have a motion and a second. Motion by Mr. Studo, second by Mr. O'Leary. Any further discussion? Hearing none, Mr. O'Leary. Aye. Mr. Walner. Aye. Mrs. Gonzalez. Aye. Mr. Studo. Aye. Mimi Pelli is aye. Uh, Madam Chair, I move to renew the following class one licenses to expire January 1st, 2022, subject to all regulatory department requirements. Brian Duck, <clears throat> Duck Hack. I don't even know. I hope I said that right. DBA National Sales. Dushek. Thank you. Um, <laughs> Melokian Subaru, North Reading Motorsports. I have a motion. Do I have a second? Second. I have Madam a motion. Chair. Okay. Madam Chair, now that's been seconded. Uh, Please have the record show that I will be recusing myself from class one and class two uh, license renewals. I have a family member that holds a class two license. All class one licenses automatically get a class two with it. So therefore I will be recusing myself. I will not be participating in the discussion nor, and I will be abstaining from the vote. Thank you, Mr. O'Leary. Okay, I have a motion by Mr. Schroeder and a second by Mr. Wyman. Any further discussion? Hearing none, Mr. Walner. Aye. Mrs. Gonzalez. Gonzalez. Aye. Mr. Studo. Aye. Manu Pelli is aye, and Mr. O'Leary abstain. Abstains. Next motion. Madam Chair, I move to renew the following class two licenses to expire January 1st, 2022, subject to all regulatory department requirements a and j auto brian dushek dba national sales nika inc dba route 28 motors p and t auto sales inc i have a motion do i have a second 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 i have a motion by mr Strudo, a second by mrs gonzalez any further discussion hearing none mr walner aye mrs gonzalez aye mr Studo. Aye. Manu Pali is aye. And Mr. O'Leary abstain. Madam Chair, I move to renew the following class three license to expire January 1st, 2022, subject to all regulatory department requirements. Brian Dushak, DBA, National Sales. Second. I have a, I have a motion by Mr. Studo and a second by Mrs. Gonzalez. Any further discussion? Hearing none, Mr. Walner. Aye. Mrs. Gonzalez. Aye. Mr. Studo. Aye. Manu Pelli is aye. And Mr. O'Leary abstain. So uh, Mr. O'Leary can vote. Mr. O'Leary votes aye. Thank you. <laughs> sorry, Mr. O'Leary. It is 11 o'clock. Sorry. We sort of lose our steam. I would. I'm going to peg it at about 10:25. We start to lose our steam. <laughs> yeah. Madam right. Chair, I apologize. Mr. O'Leary did not abstain. That's a unanimous vote, Mr. Studo. Madam Chair, I move to renew the following automatic amusement device license to expire December 31st, 2021, subject to all regulatory department requirements for Andrea's House of Pizza. Second. Motion by Mr. Studo, second by Mr. O'Leary. Any further discussion? Hearing none, Mr. O'Leary. Aye. Mr. Walner. Aye. Mrs. Gonzalez. Aye. Mr. Studo. Aye. Manu Pelli is aye. Madam Chair, I move to renew the following package store all alcohol license to expire December 31st, 2021, subject to all regulatory department requirements, Eastgate Liquors. Second. 
Motion by Mr. Studo, second by Mr. O'Leary. Any further discussion? Hearing none. Mr. O'Leary? Aye. Mr. Walner? Aye. Mrs. Gonzalez? Gonzalez? Aye. Mr. Studo? Aye. Manu Pelli is aye. Madam Chair, I move to renew the following package store wine and malt beverage license to expire December 31st, 2021, subject to all regulatory department requirements. Convenience plus. Second. I have a motion by Mr. Studo and a second by Mr. O'Leary. Any further discussion? Hearing none. Mr. O'Leary? Aye. Mr. Walner? Aye. Mrs. Gonzalez? Yes. Aye. Mr. Studo? Aye. Daniel Pelli is aye. Um, yeah, that's it for those. Next order of business is make sure our point point. And, um, uh, Madam Chair, if I can ask Mike a question, the ones in the share folder are the ones that have more than the ones that were in the packet. So I'm going to go by those ones, correct? Oh, yep. Just, let's make sure we don't miss any. Miss any. Right, there's only two in the there's only two in the packet. So. Oh, there's a there's a there's a bunch more in the uh, updated one. So I'll just use that. We'll power through. Power through. Yes, that's <laughs> correct. You're right. All right. Let me start. Yes, please. Do I have a motion? <laughs> Madam Chair, I move to place a nomination the following names for reappointment. Appointment as members of the Capital Improvement Planning Committee for terms to run concurrent with their elected terms. Catherine Menupelli through May 2021. Leanne Gonzalez through May 2022. Second. Okay, I have a motion by Mr. Studo, a second by Mr. O'Leary. Any further discussion? Hearing none. Mr. O'Leary. Aye. Mr. Walner. Aye. Mrs. Gonzalez. Gonzalez. Aye. Mr. Studo. Aye. And Manu Pelli is aye. Madam Chair, I move to appoint the following. Okay, I don't have the person's name. Um, so you don't want that. I can talk to that. The next, the next order of business is it is an appointment to the. Um, the facil facilities master plan committee. I, I spoke with the chair uh, yesterday about this at length, and um, I'd like the board to. I'd like the. I'd actually like the board to appoint me to be able to serve on behalf of the board. It overlaps with some of the responsibilities that I'm already working on, actually, with the board. They haven't met in a while, the chair said, but it, as things begin to heat up again, they're going to be starting to to um, you know, move forward with some things that are gonna be time sensitive. So uh, it's, on the, it's on the agenda for the board person that if you recall, well, some of you weren't here actually. Well, I don't think some of you were here when we did the makeup of this committee, but the board wanted representation uh, to serve on that committee and they were moving, moving forward with planning matters. Okay. That's why it's on the agenda. I think Mr. Gilberto was concerned to make sure that that we had a designee from this board to be able to take part in those to to take part. In. So I'll just I'll just if I can comment, uh, Mr. Walner. There's been a number of meetings that have already occurred with the facilities master plan committee. I think Andy was our crucial appointment before. I sat in with many of those meetings as well. So if you want to be our official appointee, that's great. I, I think I have a great interest in continuing to attend those meetings and participating any way I can. So you know, if there's no objection on your part, I think that would make a lot of sense. It ties into everything I'm working on as well. Um, and I think I have something to offer there. And also the consultants of the Winter Street and the uh, Main Street projects are 
in consult with the facilities master planning consult. So there's a there's a direct connection to things that are already being in process. So anyways, just wanted to make that comment. Thanks, Mr. Walner. Any other discussion? Hearing none, is there a motion? Madam Chair, I move to appoint the following individuals to the Facilities Master Plan Committee for a term to expire concurrent with their term on the select board. Catherine Manupelli. Catherine, sorry, let's get it slow. <laughs> <laughs> that's okay. I've been called worse. <laughs> and that's my newborn's middle name, so I should probably, you know, uh, not, you know not. Okay, I have a motion by Mr. Do I have a second? I second. Okay, motion by Mr. Schuh, second by Mrs. Gonzalez. Any further discussion? Just, uh, yeah, I think, uh, Madam Chair, again, no, no disrespect, and I appreciate your willingness to step up because this is going to be a lot of work. Already has been, but it will be a lot of work. But I think um, it dovetails rather nicely with uh, Mr. Waller's efforts already. Uh, that he's committed hundreds of hours to, um, and I think there'll be a, a better coordination uh, between all of them if, if Mr. Walner, if you would be willing to let Mr. Walner serve. But you know, again, I respect your willingness to step up and take on the responsibilities. But I think Mr. Walner's <laughs> effort already um, would dovetail nicely with serving on that. Are you, did you want to submit Mr. Waller's name to, into, nom, I'm sorry, Mr. Earlier, did you want to submit Mr. Waller's name, name into nomination? Is that what you're yeah, 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 that? Yeah, I, I would, I would, I would prefer to do that. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. So you open, open, would, the, open, so open yeah. the nominations. Yeah. So again, okay. if Mr. Studer would just include uh, Mrs. Magnapelli and Mr. Waller. Uh, then we can take a roll call vote like we would normally take. Sure. Okay. So, the Mr. Studo, do you want to make, make a new motion? Madam Chair, I move to appoint one of the following individuals to the Facility Master Plan Committee for a term to expire concurrent with their term on the select board. Uh, either Richard Walner or Catherine Manipelli. <laughs> All right. I have a motion by Mr. Studo. Do I have a second? Do a second. Second. Second by Mr. O'Leary. Any further discussion? Okay. So we'll, this is a roll call name vote. Mr. O'Leary. Mr. O'Leary. Mr. Walner. Mr. Walner. Mr. Walner. Mr. Walner. Mr. Walner. Mrs. Gonzalez. Mrs. Manipelli. Mr. Studo. This is Manu Pelli. And Manu Pelli is missing. All right. All right. There is other um, appointments, which uh, we don't have in our packet. So I do you here. So there, there's a bunch more. So I'm going to be here for a while, just so everybody knows. I'm sorry. I didn't put this together, by the way. We're going to be with you. <laughs> yeah. So just hanging in here. Okay. Madam Chair, I move to reappoint Barbara Stats as the State Ethics Commission liaison for a term to expire on December 31st, 2021. I have a motion by Mr. Studo. Do I have a second? Second. Second. Second by Mr. O'Leary. Any further discussion? Hearing none. Mr. O'Leary? Uh, Mrs. Stats. Mr. Walner? Mrs. Stats. Mrs. Gonzalez? Gonzalez. Mrs. Stats? Mr. Studo. Mr. Studo. Mrs. Stats. And Manu Pelli is Mrs. Stats. Madam Chair, I move to reappoint Marianne McKay as town treasurer for a term to expire on December 31st, 2021. Second. Motion by Mr. Studo, second by Mr. O'Leary. Any further discussion? See, hearing none, Mr. O'Leary. Uh, Ms. McKay. Mr. Walner. Marianne McKay. Mrs. Gonzalez. Marianne McKay. Mr. Studo. Marianne McKay. And Manu Pelli is Mrs. McKay. Madam Chair, I move the place in nomination the following names for reappointment as 
process serving constables for terms to expire on December 31st, 2021. Uh, there are five openings, but there's three names being put for nomination. John Fiorello, Douglas Lab, and David Rosati. I have a motion. Do I have a second? Second. second. Motion by Mr. Studo, second by Mr. Gonzalez. So three for reappointment to five positions, Mr. Studo? Yes. Okay. Uh, any further discussion? Hearing none. Mr. O'Leary? Mr. Fiorello, Mr. Lab, and Mr. Rosetti. Mr. Walner, Mr. Walner, Mr. Fiorello, Mr. Mr. Lemon, and Mr. Rosati. Mr. Rosati. Mrs. Gonzalez, Mr. Fiorello, Mr. Lab, and Mr. Rosati. Mr. Sudo, John Fiorello, Douglas Lab, David Rosati. Okay, and Manu Pelli is Fiorello, Lab, and Rosati. I have a question before the next motion. Um, is there a reason we're saying the names and not just saying yes or no? Uh, I'm sorry, I just don't know. Is, is that how it works? I, I just don't know. It's a roll call name vote is typically. Oh, I see, okay. I just oh, didn't know if everything else was. Yeah. Okay, everything else is like yes it's or no. Kind of kind of, if it's only one person, sometimes we we say I or yay, but it's nice to acknowledge that. I think it's a nice to acknowledge them by name and okay. stepping up to serve. Then the next one, I hope, I mean, you guys might need this one in front of you. Uh, Madam Chair, I move to place in nomination the following names for appointment reappointment as members of the Conservation Commission for terms to expire December 31st, 2023. Tomas Sanchez, Lauren Bashara, Michael Hooley, Chris Lep Lippert, Sirish Rao, Erin Matt Daniels, David Doucette, James Shaney, Allison Papavasilio, Yan Huang. Second. I have a motion by Mr. Studo and a second by Mr. O'Leary. Any further discussion? Madam Chair. Mr. Um, O'Leary. If you recall, over the last year or two, we've had a, a, a big change in the Conservation Commission and several openings and lots of applicants. And it was a wonderful thing. And again, we still have uh, people interested in participating on a regular basis. Uh, Mr. Sanchez and uh, Ms. Bashara are uh, both incumbents who were appointed last year to unexpired terms. Uh, both have been uh, regularly attending and serving and serving well in the Conservation Commission and in consultation with the uh, chair of the Conservation Commission, Lauren Michener. Uh, we are both recommending uh, that uh, Mr. Sanchez and Ms. Bashara be reappointed. Mr. O'Leary, is it two openings? Yes, the, the two, yeah. And it's two openings, two openings two because of the two terms yeah. expiring. Two terms are expiring. Uh, there is still one uh, associate membership um, opening, and I would anticipate that uh, by our next meeting, I'll have a recommendation to fill that associate membership 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 right. slot. Okay, great. So um, we've so heard from Mr. Okay, and our liaison has made his. Uh, Mr. Sanchez and Ms. Bashara. Any further discussion? Hearing none, Mr. O'Leary. Mr. Sanchez, Ms. Bashara. Mr. Walner. Mr. Sanchez, Ms. B Bashara. Mrs. Gonzalez. Mr. Sanchez and Ms. Bashara. Mr. Studo. I will take Mr. O'Leary's recommendation and it's Mr. Sanchez and Mrs. Bashara. Okay, Manu Pelli is Mr. Sanchez and Ms. Bishara. Okay. Madam Chair, I move to place in nomination the following names for reappointment appointments of the Hillview Commission for terms to expire on December 31st, 2023. There are three openings. Charles, Charles Carucci, incumbent, incumbent, William King, incumbent, Francis Hackey, incumbent, Daniela Claiborne, David Lee, Chris... Liebert, Nicholas Masse, Henry Burke, Peter Jackson, Kristen Sullivan, Vincent Ragucci, Thomas Ward. Motion by Mr. Studo, second by Mr. O'Leary. Mr. O'Leary. 
Thank you, Madam Chair, again, liaison uh, to the Hillview Commission. Uh, we have uh, three openings. Uh, three incumbents are seeking reappointment. That's Mr. Carucci, Mr. King, and Mr. Hatchie. Uh, again, uh, Mr. King, I believe this is his second term. Mr. Carucci, probably his third. Uh, Mr. Hatchie, again, a long time uh, member of the, one of the original members of the Hillview Commission, uh, had, a, had a hiatus, is now back on the commission. All of them extremely active, as you can be aware. Uh, this year has been a very challenging year in relation to um, the operations of the, of the Hillview. Uh, in not just the golf course, but also the, the facility itself. And uh, they've been active members and uh, in consultation with Mr. Stack, who is the chair. Uh, we're recommending the reappointment of Mr. Carucci, Mr. King, and Mr. Hatchie. Thank you, Thank you Mr. O'Leary. Any further discussion? Hearing none, Mr. O'Leary. Mr. Carucci, Mr. King, Mr. Hatchie. Mr. Walner. Mr. Carucci, Mr. King, and Mr. Hatchie. Mrs. Gonzalez. Gonzalez. Mr. Carucci, Mr. King, and Mr. Hatchie. Mr. Studo. Mr. Studo. Mr. Carucci, Mr. King, and Mr. Hatchie. And Manu Pelli is Carucci, King, and Hatchie. Thank you, fellow board members. Madam Chair, I move to place in nomination the following names for reappointment appointment to the Historic District Commission for terms to expire on December 31st, 2023. There are four openings and four nominations. All incum incumbents Mark Hall, David Ham, Paul Chapman, Thomas Parker. Okay, I have a motion by Mr. Studo. Do I have a second? Second. Okay. Who's the liaison? I am. Okay. Second by Mr. Walner. Motion by Mr. Studo. <laughs> Mr. Walner, we are keeping you up. <laughs> Mr. Walner. To me. We're all on the same page. I recommend them. We still need to hear. We still need to hear from you. Even though it's four for four, who do you recommend? Mark Hall, David Ham, Paul Chapman, and Thomas Parker. Thank you, Mr. Walker. Any further discussion? Hearing none, Mr. O'Leary. Mr. Hall, Mr. Ham, Mr. Chapman, Mr. Parker. Mr. Walner. Mr. Hall, Mr. Ham, Mr. Chapman, Mr. Parker. Mrs. Gonzalez. Mr. Hall, Mr. Ham, Mr. Chapman, Mr. Parker. Mr. Studo. Mr. Parker, Mr. Chapman, Mr. Ham, Mr. Hall. <laughs> and Manny Pelly is Hall, Ham, Chapman, and Parker. Last one. Well, of this. Madam Chair, I move to place a nomination the following name for a reappointment. Of Appointment to the Youth Services Committee for the terms as noted. There are five openings and five uh, applicants. Uh, Amy DeCara, incumbent. Francis Ferrado, incumbent. Deborah Mahoney, Jody Sponzo, Jan Hawan. Excuse me, Excuse me Mr. Studo, I think you need to put the, the expiration dates for some couple of- Oh, I'm sorry, okay. Uh, all, um, for Amy DeCara, it's December 31st, 2023. Francis Ferraro, December 31st, 2023. Deborah Mahoney, December 31st, 2023. Jody Sponzo, December 31st, 2023. And Jan Juano, December 31st, 2023. Who was filling an unexpired term. Yeah. Okay, I have a motion by Mr. Studo. Do I have a second? Madam Chair. Um, there, there is a mistake in the name of it. Should be Yan Hong, H A U N G. Okay. And also Deborah Mahoney is incumbent. Okay. Okay. So motion by right. Studo. Do I have a second? Second. 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 Second by Ms. Carlos. Mrs. Gonzalez. Um, yep, so um, in speaking with Mr. Majain, the um, chair, um, we are recommending all five, uh, the two, two new members who joined in a Zoom meeting and met everybody. And um, so we are re recommending all five. 
Is that committee full? Yes, this this fills it. Okay. Okay, thank you. Uh, any further discussion? Hearing none, Mr. O'Leary. Amy DeChara, Francis Ferrari, Deborah Mahoney, Jody Sponzo, and Mr. Walner. Mr. Walner. Amy DeChara, Francis Ferraro, Deborah Mahoney, Jody Sponzo, and Jan Wong. Mrs. Gonzalez. Amy DeChara, Francis Ferraro, Deborah Mahoney, Jody Sponzo, and Jan Hong. Mr. Sudo. Cara, Francis Ferraro, Deborah Mahoney, Jody Sponzo, Jan Hong. And Manu Pelli is Deshara, Ferraro, Mahoney, Sponzo, and Hong. Okay, next order of business. We're, for the moment, we'll, we'll be wrapping these up for next, next time. Uh, hopefully everybody will finish connecting with their boards and perspectives, um, appointees, and we'll be finishing the rest of these up. Next order of business is to review or from the special municipal employee designations. And we have an explanation in the packet, but Mr. Gilberto, if you want to give a summary for us, just the same quickly. thing we did last year as well. It, it is so that this is a, effectively a, a rolling over of the previously authorized designations um for special municipal employee um positions and these are largely part-time positions where we have at times struggled to identify candidates and where candidates have expressed interest who have other um, employment um, with the town that's part-time in nature and they're maybe looking to supplement that and so these positions are uh, they are advertised and we'll go forward with uh, filling them and um the human resources director has done some um, initial outreach with the departments um, over the past couple of years and continues to be a, a need and we are forecasting a need going into next year so we are requesting that the board renew these designations for calendar year 2021. Okay, Two. any further questions? Is there a motion? Madam Chair, I move to reconfirm the vote of December 16, 2019 designating the following positions as having special municipal Employee status pursuant to Mass General Law Chapter 268A for parks and recreation, infant toddler instructor, after school instructor coach, summer program instructor coach, summer program director, summer program assistant director, summer counselor. For police, matron, crossing guard, council on aging, van driver, finance committee, recording secretary, Police Department co-facilitators for the Youth Action Team, Library Substitute Library Technician. And the following position is voted on February 25th, 2019 for the Board of Health Public Health Nurse. Second. I have a motion by Mr. Studo, a second by Mr. O'Leary. Any further discussion? Hearing none, Mr. O'Leary. Aye. Mr. Walner. Aye. Mrs. Gonzalez? Gonzalez? Aye. Mr. Studo? Aye. And Manu Pelli is aye. Next order of business is to review the upcoming board meeting schedule. And Mr. Gilberto had suggested to us January 11th, January 25th, February 8th, and February 22nd as proposed meeting dates coming up. Um, and do the members have the availability? On those days, you're filling up my social calendar. Yeah, this is... <laughs> and Mr. Gilbert he was working around the holiday. He worked around the holiday in January, and that's why there. Those are proposed. Does that work for everybody? Yes, too. Any purposes? Yes. Okay. I heard that January 11th. Not one January 11th. January 25th. February 8th. And February 22nd. All good. 
Uh, yeah, that should be fine. All right. Sounds like it works for everybody. So we'll schedule those in, Mr. Gilberto. Great. Thank you. And we have a next order of business, which is the town administrator's report. Thank you, Madam Chair. The only thing that I have to report is that we have received Reading Municipal Light Department the 2021 calendars, which I know so many in the community um, look forward to receiving. Um, we, we do have a stash, if you will, here in Town Hall, and I encourage anybody who is interested in obtaining um, one to contact our office uh, at 978 664 6010. Um, we did work with Reading Light to try to make sure we had. Um, a reasonable amount here in place and we are actually mailing them out uh, in response to any requests that we get. Um, so uh, to the board members, I'm not sure if you've been mailed one at this point yet or not, but if you've not received one and are interested, please let us know. Um, and the same goes for the community. Um, they are first come, first serve, and when they come out, they are. I want to thank Karen for making sure that they get into everybody's hands. I believe we did a mailing to all of the participants in the Senior Tax Workout Program as well. Um, just to make sure that they uh, they got one. Uh, a lot of those folks, um, you know, stop by the town hall and are able to pick them up. So, and that's all. Thank you. Thank you, Miss. Thank you for keeping it short too. <laughs> all right. The next is all the new business, Mr. O'Leary. Uh, just again for all those people who are stepping forward and volunteering to serve on boards, committees, and commissions. Uh, thank them very much. And, uh, and again, if you didn't, again, we only have so many slots to fill, but we'll, we'll try and find a spot for everybody. Anybody that was looking to step forward, I well, we appreciate that. And other than that, just um, everybody just wear a mask, be safe, be smart. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Walner? Uh, no comment. Thank you. Okay. Mrs. Gonzalez? Nope, I'm I'm good. Um, nope, I'm good. Thanks. Okay, Mr. Studos. All set. I'm all set too. We had a long night tonight, but we had a lot of we had three public hearings basically. So we we should probably maybe try to plan one one next time one at a time. But it's inevitable. All right. Do we have a motion to adjourn? Madam Chair, I. Move to adjourn. <laughs> Motion by Mr. Studo, second by Mr. O'Leary. Mr. O'Leary. A reluctant eye. Mr. <laughs> Mr. Walner. <laughs> He's already asleep, poor guy. Poor Mrs. Guy. Gonzalez. A big eye. Mr. Studo. Hi. And Manu Pelley's eye. Thank you, folks. Thank you, folks.